So today is uh, Friday, June 18th. Uh, we have made it through the second week and a quarter of the way through our summer school, uh, which means we are on our last lecture uh, for this section. We're gonna finish up the rest of the integumentary system and then there should be room time at the end of this uh, for a question answer review to help us to prepare for Monday's exams. Uh, again, Monday, we're not meeting. You don't have to come to Zoom or anything like that. You just need to take the exams on that day. I've said this uh, numerous times, but I wanna make sure you're fully clear on this. Uh, there are two exams, both a lab and a lecture exam. Uh, both need to be taken. Uh, you can take them in any order that you want, but as I've said from previous experience, uh, very few students have ever had problems with the lecture exam, but I've had more that have had problems with images loading and, and load times and things like that with the lab exam. So I encourage you to start with the lab exam first. Uh, make sure it's working properly to make sure you have the yeah. enough time to fix it if there's an issue. Also, just to be clear, there is a time for the exams. I haven't finished the exams, but let's say for argument's sake, the lecture exam has two hours that you have to take the exam in. Obviously, you don't have to use all of that time, but the other thing to remember is that it, the exams must be completed during class time. So if you wait till noon to start your lecture exam, you're not gonna get your full two hours because when the class ends at 1235, that is when you'll be kicked out of the exam. So that would mean you'd only have 35 minutes to take it. So make sure you plan accordingly because they don't have to be started, they must be finished during the class time. So you will not be able to start them uh, before eight o'clock and uh, you will not be able to continue to take them after. <laughs> All right, someone's having a party. I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone. Uh, excellent. All right, and again, that's all we're doing on Monday. We're not meeting. There's no lecture, nothing. You're just taking the exams, which is enough. Uh, then you get a whole 24 hours off, and you get to come back Tuesday morning, and we will be uh, starting our skeletal system uh, uh, discussion, and we'll also, like I said, be forming groups, because uh, rather than me standing here going, this is a femur, this is the head of the femur, and something along those lines, it's way more entertaining for you guys to do that. Uh, so we'll be doing it in groups, and you guys will be presenting, and we'll be talking about that uh, next week. So uh, again, it's very low-key. You're not being graded on your presentation skills. This is just a way of getting everybody active in the learning process. So that's all that's about. All right, questions on any of that? question so on canvas if you go to the exam it says it's you due on monday at 8 a.m does it mean it's going to open at 8 a.m or it's going to be a like... great question so <laughs> as i mentioned i haven't actually finished finalizing the exams yet so those two uh the, the thing for the lab exam and the lecture exam are really just placeholders so that they will be there on the schedule so that you know that they're there. Uh, probably tomorrow or possibly Sunday, I will get the exams finalized and then they'll be up there. So that's just a placeholder to remind you that the exam is on Monday. It starts at eight. You cannot take it before eight, it starts at eight. And then you'll have the entire class time, four and a half hours to complete both exams. So yeah, those, those that are there are just uh, placeholders right now to remind you that at eight o'clock, on Monday morning, you have a lab and a lecture exam to start. Okay, so yeah, thank you. I apologize for the confusion of that. I just, I want, cause cause you have that great schedule that shows you what everything is. I wanted to make sure that you knew on those days we had the exam, but I haven't finished writing the exams yet. So that's why uh, the real exams aren't there. Those are just placeholders. And actually, if you look at all of the exams, you'll see the exact same thing. They look at the exact same way because they're just placeholders to, to show us the dates that it's on right now. Awesome, great question, any others? All righty, excellent, then let's go ahead and get started. We left off last time and we had been working our way through the primary organ of the skin, uh, the dermis and the epidermis. And as we said, we left off, we are gonna now talk about the components, all of the accessory structures associated with the skin as well. Starting first with the glands. As we hinted at in the last class, there are two main types of glands that are found in the skin, and they are sebaceous glands, uh, which are oil glands, and sudoriferous glands, which are sweat glands. So again, we've used the term sweat and oil before, but we're gonna use the appropriate term sebaceous glands. 
Sebaceous glands, as it turns out, are located over the entire surface of the body, except for the palms of our hands and the soles of the feet. Why do you think that would be? What's special about that area? There's no hair. Exactly, right? That's obviously where the thick skin is. But the real reason those aren't present in those locations is because there are no hair there. If we cheat and go back to the picture we were just looking at, excellent, uh, you will see here they have actually drawn us a couple. Here is a sebaceous gland. Here is a sebaceous gland. And notice they are connected to the follicle where the hair is located. So all sebaceous glands connect to hair follicles. All hairs, as we'll talk about when we talk about hairs, there's primary hairs and secondary hairs and other types of hairs. And so both primary and secondary hairs have sebaceous glands. But where we don't have hair in the thick skin, the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, we do not have sebaceous glands. And here's another picture that shows this as well. <clears throat> now, as we know, any gland we talk about, there are three main things we need to know about them. We need to know the substance they produce. We need to know their structural classification. And we need to know their functional classification. And remember, when we talk about functional classification, really what we were talking about is their mode of secretion, how they release uh, the substances that they are released. So let's do that for our sebaceous glands. For starters, sebaceous glands, as we look at the light microscopy view of it here, is a branched acinar gland or a branched, remember we could also use the term alveolar. Someone break that term down for me. What does it mean to be branched alveolar or branched to synar? That it has one duct and um, two secretion structures. Yeah, one duct or, more. or two or more secretory structures. And what else do we know about those secretory structures? That they're the like ball shape and not. Yeah. Excellent, All right? Because we understand our structural classifications, we're able to interpret that. And then notice then when we look at our picture here, we can see this. Actually, what's cool about this particular picture that I like is you can actually see the duct where the opening is that the secretion would be released into this. One of, again, remember when we're dealing with histology, one of the things we're always looking for is dead giveaways uh, that we uh, are looking at something in particular. And notice here, we have that a portion, a dense part, there's more actually, it's wider than this is here. It actually goes all the way out here like this. Uh, but this is the hair follicle. This is where the hair would be located. And so notice this is connected to the hair follicle. So that should be a dead giveaway that you're looking at a sebaceous gland, but it has the one duct and it has a bunch of ball shape secretary structures. And notice when you look at the cells, at first, they look a lot like adipose. Adipose, remember, has that very clear center to the cell because of all of the fat that is inside of it, the lipids that are inside of it. However, notice, unlike adipose, the nuclei are located in the centers of the cells here. Remember, with adipose, the nucleus is pushed to the side giving us that diamond ring shape. So one of the nice things about this is again, it is producing an oily substance. So not surprisingly, these cells are relatively clear, but the nucleus is smack dab in the middle of these cells. So it's clearly not adipose. Big oily substance connected to a hair follicle that tells us we lurking at a sebaceous gland. <clears throat> Now, its functional type, its mode of secretion is holocrine. What does that mean? The cell ruptures after it uh, releases its, its content. Yeah, notice these cells are filling up with oil and then what's gonna happen and other stuff, and then it is gonna rupture 
and cell and the cell dies and is replaced by new ones as it goes through that process. Excellent. So then the last thing we have to talk about is what it releases. The substance it releases isn't, while it has a lot of oil in it, is appropriately called sebum. Sebum is a very thick, very viscous, very organic material because not only is it the oil and the other components, but when the cell ruptures and dies, it releases all of its contents. As we talked about, when you're washing your hands constantly and getting that sebum off of your hands, it causes your hands to dry and crack, which uh, affects your defenses against pathogens. So in this case, the sebum, his job is to help to provide some moisture, help to provide uh, some waterproofing. There is a minor antibacterial component to it, <clears throat> but do we necessarily want our skin to be completely free of bacteria? No. I know we're all walking around with hand sanitizer and all that kind of stuff right now, but um, typically on a square centimeter of your skin, you have somewhere on the order of 10,000 bacteria. Now, again, usually when I say that, people go diving for their Purell as they hear that. But is that necessarily a bad thing that we have 10,000 bacteria on a square centimeter of our skin? No. No, it's actually what we call resident bacteria. And that resident bacteria is actually part of our body's defenses. Those resident bacteria are benign. They're not harmful. And so what they're able to do by being there is they're able to form a nice big colony. Uh, they're a very active colony so that if a harmful bacteria tries to come in and make purchase, those resident bacteria can outcompete them for resources, for materials, for substances like that. And it can stop it from getting purchased and stop it from getting into the body. So while there's a minor antibacterial component to our sebum, we really don't want it to be completely antibacterial because we don't want to wipe out that resident bacteria that's on our surface. And as we talked about in the last class, uh, the production of the sebum is controlled by hormones. So one of the things that happens as we enter puberty, as we get an increase in our hormone production, we can get an overproduction of sebum. That overproduction of sebum can actually cause this structure to become congested and blocked. As it becomes congested and blocked, we have a large amount of warm, moist, wet material, organic material there, the kind of thing that bacteria absolutely loves. And it can be infected with bacteria and form what we call acne. All right, questions on that? All righty, excellent. So let's talk about our second type of glands, pseudoriferous glands. Now, unlike sebaceous, which is just one type of gland, pseudoriferous, is a class of glands. So in other words, when we say a gland is pseudoriferous, this is a general term. Because as it turns out, there are actually four specific types of pseudoriferous glands. Now, the good news about that is even though there's four specific types, the structural and functional classifications of them are all the same. Obviously, the substances that they produce are different but the structural and functional classification of all of our pseudoriferous glands are the same. So if it's a pseudoriferous gland, then you know no matter which of the four type it is, it is going to be a simple coiled tubular gland. And someone remind me what that means? Uh, single tubular, that just twists and goes through a pore. Sorry, it's uh, one duct and one secretory. 
Excellent. So we have one twisted tube shaped secretary structure and one duct. Excellent. Now, notice our illustrator has done a nice job of showing us this with our picture here because they've actually shown us one that would look more three dimensional. So it comes around and it's all like this. And this is what it would be if it was bulging out three dimensional. However, when we look at this under the microscope, is that what we're going to see? Just one continuous tube as we look at it? No, I think no. I used the example in the last class. If I took a ball of yarn and cut a ball of yarn in half, you would not see one continuous piece of yarn. You'd see a bunch of yarn pieces because you're taking a two-dimensional view at a three-dimensional structure. So when we look at these sudoriferous glands under the microscope, this is what it's going to look like. You're going to see a bunch of irregular shaped because some of the tubes are going to be cut in cross section. Some will be more longitudinal. Some may be oblique. We're going to see a bunch of tube pieces at all sorts of different orientations all clustered together. So while the illustrators can sometimes or model makers can sometimes show us a full three dimensional view of them. Definitely when we look at it under the microscope. Uh, you will see these tube pieces. All right. And I think we see that also in the picture I'm going to show you in just a minute, some light microscopy. Excellent. And someone remind me, actually, I liked all that stuff. Let's put that back. I just want to get rid of the drawings. All right. Excellent. And someone remind me what it means to use the Merocrine mode of secretion. Uh, just where the cells release its secretory fluid into a pouch and then pushes it out through the pore. Okay, but how does it actually release it from the cell? Uh, Exocytosis. Yeah. Excellent. Yep, so Merocrine mode of secretion means that the cell releases its substance via exocytosis. Excellent. All right, so again, whoops. This is true for all of our four different types of pseudoriferous glands. So let's talk now about the specific types. The first specific type, and by far the most common, are what are known as eccrine sweat glands. Now, originally, these eccrine sweat glands were also referred to as merocrine sweat glands. But here's the problem. As we now know, all pseudoriferous glands use the merocrine mode of secretion. So is it really useful to call them merocrine? No, I mention it here because A, anonymous hate us, but B, because you may still run into it some in some of the literature. But I think eccrine is a much more uh, appropriate term to use because it helps us to distinguish them. As I mentioned, these are the most common. Here is what they look like histologically. Notice one of the keys with an eccrine sweat gland. We see all the tube pieces and look at the size of the wall of the tube compared to the size of the lumen. What's bigger, the wall or the lumen? The wall. Yeah. Notice these have very thin, small lumens to them. The reason they have such thin, small lumens to them is our eccrine sweat glands are the ones that produce our watery sweat. This is the sweat that we use to regulate our body temperature. All right, now notice I mentioned these are the most common. So let's think about this. The entire surface of your skin, is there a surface, is there a portion of your body, a surface of your skin, a location on your skin that doesn't sweat? No, All right? You can produce, you got up and ran around the room 16 times from the tip of your toes to the top of the head, you would produce sweat. Now. Do you produce an equal amount of sweat in all locations? 
No, yeah. you have far more sweat glands of these eccrine sweat glands on the palm of your hand, for instance, than you do on your forearm. But they're everywhere. That's why they're the most common ones. These ones are the ones that are found everywhere. And their job is to produce watery sweat. If you were to sit quietly in a controlled environment, right, uh, not move at all during that period of time, you'd only produce about 500 milliliters of this watery sweat during the course of the day. However, you poor schlubs back in Sacramento uh, are gonna have what, 108 degree temperature today? If you decided to go outside and tar your roof in that 108 degree weather, would you only produce half a liter of sweat? No. No, these glands are capable of producing as much as eight liters of sweat in a 24 hour period of time. Now, do you have eight liters of extra fluid that you can afford to lose from your body in a 24 hour period of time? No. No, which is why uh, regulating our water input is so important in warm temperatures because we have that ability to lose so much water so quickly, become dehydrated, become you know overheated, things along those lines because of that. All right. Obviously, it is not just water that is being released. Uh, ions are being released. Waste products are being released, like we talked about. Antibodies to provide some protection and other types of materials as well. We can tell something about an individual by their sweat. As I mentioned, if someone was drinking heavily the night before, you can often smell that as it's coming off of their skin or garlic, uh, certain medications, right? Or uh, what would someone sweat smell like if they had uncontrolled diabetes mellitus? It smells sweet. Yeah, it would have a sweet smell, absolutely. All that extra glucose that was in their uh, blood, some of that would be expelled through their sweat. So they uh, typically, someone who doesn't have their diabetes under control can actually get a, a sweet smell to their sweat as a result of it as well. All right, questions on these? Notice, <clears throat> I didn't bring it up, but let's go ahead back to it because I think it is useful. Again, we're going to look at those uh, skin models again, which quite frankly should be a dead giveaway, even though I've already told you that they're going to be on the exam. I guaranteed you they're going to be on the exam. So definitely make sure you're looking at them and learning them but let's go ahead and look at it anyway. Notice as we look at this one here, we can see, uh, as we've already done, here is our uh, sebaceous glands located on their hair follicles. Uh, notice also that here we see some examples of some sudoriferous glands. Notice unlike the sebaceous glands, there's no hair in our thick skin, but there are merocrine or pardon me, eccrine sweat glands, simple coiled tubes, right? And then they're releasing their sweat and here's another one and here's another one. So we see all of those on the model and the other model has it as well. I won't bother showing you that, but you'll see it there as well. But remember the eccrine sudoriferous gland is only one of those. So let's talk about the second. Professor, the sec I, oh, yes, sorry, go ahead. Question. Uh, on, on that pre, not the not the actual uh, cheating. Looking at the book view of it, it shows the eccrine gland. Does that look like it's going into a hair follicle? Like or is is so, this, this be going to a gland? Great question. Uh, this one here is the eccrine sweat gland. This is a different sweat gland, and that's the one we're going to talk about next. So you are correct. This one does appear to be going into a hair follicle and it indeed it is because it's not an eccrine sweat gland. Instead, it is the one we talked about last time, the epocrine sweat gland. Epocrine sweat glands are the ones that uh, are produce that organic sweat. Notice one of the ways you can tell this, and we'll go back to the cheat picture from your textbook again in a minute, 
Notice now the difference in the size of the wall of our gland versus the size of the lumen of our gland. Which is bigger for this one? The lumen. Lumen. So notice they're both coiled tubular glands. We're seeing some cut tubes at different orientations, but this one's lumen is massive because this one produces a much more organic sweat. This organic sweat doesn't play as much of a role in our um, temperature regulation as the eccrine one does. So what is it there for? Well, as we talked about previously, uh, humans don't have pheromones per se, but these epocrine sweat glands produce a musky organic scent that when first produced, uh, typically uh, receives a very pleasant uh, association with it. So many people like the smell of it, uh, enjoy the smell of it, or can be attracted to the smell of it. Uh, however, being more organic, this is also the one that if you leave your gym clothes in your gym bag for three days, uh, the bacteria gets in and makes it stink. So this is all the, also the ones that can be associated with poor hygiene and therefore uh, body odor as well. These, as the illustration shows, and notice not only are they helping us here by showing us that this connects to a hair, but notice the tube is much larger looking in this one than it is here. And I appreciate it's a little bit subjective, but when we saw it histologically, we see this has much, much larger lumen to it. And not only is it associated with hair, but specifically these are associated with our secondary hairs. What do I mean when I say secondary hairs? Uh, things like the beard, armpit hair. Yeah, these are hairs that are not present at birth, but become present upon puberty. One of the ways that we tell girl people from women people, one of the ways we tell boy people from men people, right? These secondary hairs. So these are found in places like the axillary region, anal genital region, areolar region, buccal region, right? All of those kind of uh, locations. Which brings us back to the model. That's why I wanted to bring this back up. Notice if you look closely at this model, we saw clearly how they did a very nice job of dividing and separating thick skin from thin skin. But if you look closely at this model, you'll see that it's not just two different sections. It's, whoops, my drawing skills are a little off. It's actually three. If we look closely, this is clearly our thick skin. And these two over here are thin skin. But this piece over here is more like the antibrachial region. or the scalp region. Whereas this one here in the middle is axillary. And what's the difference between the antibrachial and the axillary region? Uh, that gland and the axillary right in the middle. There you go, exactly. Axillary region has secondary hair. And you are absolutely correct. As you notice here, where there is a secondary hair in the axillary region, notice we have a simple coiled tubular gland that is much larger than the eccrine one right next to it, much more thicker, much more organic. And this represents that uh, epocrine gland. All right, uh, notice if we go to the other model, it does the same thing. Notice thick skin over here, uh, brachial or scalp region over here, and then right in the middle again, we have that epocrine gland connected to a hair follicle. So this represents something like the axillary 
or the anal genital region. So they do a nice job of showing us these differences of the two different, two different main types of uh, pseudoriferous glands. Now, that brings us back to the one last problem associated with this. Remember, these are called epocrine glands because they're producing a more viscous, more organic sweat. And first, uh, anatomists thought they used the epocrine mode of secretion. So the first one was called merocrine because he used merocrine. This one is called epocrine because he used epocrine. But what's the problem with that? Merocrine? Yeah, the is problem system? with it is they realized, oh crap, these glands associated with the secondary hairs don't actually use the epocrine mode of secretion. They are pseudoriferous glands. They use the merocrine mode of secretion. So this is a gland called an epocrine gland. Here, epocrine gland is its name, not its functional classification. That seems like a pretty huge oversight. So why haven't they changed the names of these? They don't want to admit they're wrong. No, oh, no, they have no problem with that. It's an even bigger issue than that. What is it? So one thing I told you, you have to learn in this class. Anatomists hate you. There you go. It's because the anatomists hate you. Yeah, I know. I, I don't have a good reason for why. I don't know why. As we've seen, they're trying to get away from uh, more of those antiquated terms like Merkel cells or Pacinian corpuscles. Uh, but this seems like such an obvious thing that should be changed. I don't have any idea why they haven't. So there it is. It is what it is. Epocrine by name, not by function. If you can survive that, you'll be fine. Again, these are also the ones that are active at puberty. My two lovely daughters, when they were young, were able to uh, run around the house hours upon hours on end and still smell absolutely like roses. Whereas Little, who will be 14 next month, uh, do I enjoy going into her room these days? No, it reeks, right? She refuses to open the windows. She's got her door closed all the time because she's in there TikToking or whatever. Uh, so yes, uh, she definitely has very much reached puberty. Uh, so absolutely. So these are the ones that become active at puberty, start giving us that organic musty scent that I now associate with my daughter's bedroom. All right, questions on that? Excellent. There we go, we did all of that. Now, remember, we did say there were four types of pseudoriferous glands. Ecrine are the most common, epocrine are second, and then we have two highly specialized. These two highly specialized are really more of modified pseudoriferous glands, right? Both of the first ones produced sweat, one a more watery sweat, one a more organic sweat, but they both produce sweat. Whereas these two are highly modified and don't actually produce sweat. Now, what I will tell you is that you are not responsible for these histologically. So I'm not gonna show you this gland. Notice if you look at this gland, this one looks very much like the epocrine gland, large lumen, very thin wall. So it's very hard to tell them apart. So I'm not gonna make you do them uh, on, the, uh, on the histology slides, but we definitely need to know what they are and what they do. And this one that we're looking at here is what is known as a ceruminous gland. Anyone know where you might find a, a ceruminous gland? In your ear. Yeah, exactly. There's a little hint right here. The space up here is your external auditory meatus, what we commonly refer to as your ear hole. Absolutely. And so what is it that these ceruminous glands do? Earwax. Excellent. Of course, it doesn't 
isn't called earwax, the appropriate anatomical blah, 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 the appropriate anatomical term for it, term for it is cerumen. But absolutely, cerumen is what we commonly refer to as earwax. So obviously only found in one location. Well, I guess two, because you have two ear holes. Uh, and it produces cerumen. What is the function of cerumen? Anybody know? <laughs> it stops bacteria. It captures dust and debris. And it actually has a little bit of uh, insect repellent quality to it. Now, I'm not recommending the next time that you go camping, just take earwax and rub it on your body to keep the mosquitoes away. But is it important to discourage bugs from crawling into our ear hole? This is the part where you yeah. say yes, enthusiastically. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, yes. So why, why is it that mosquitoes always go to your ear? I don't know. I, I, no, ah, I have an answer for you for that. It isn't that the mosquitoes always go towards your ear. It is that when they go near your ear, that is when you're more likely to notice them because you hear them. That when they're hovering around your knee, you're not aware of it the same way as you are when they're hovering around your ear because when you hover around your ear, you hear them. So that is actually an illusion of perception. All right, excellent. Questions on that one? So the last one are the mammary glands. Where are the mammary glands located? Your breasts? Yeah, in the breasts, absolutely. Both males and females have them. However, males and females who have never been pregnant, these glands are in an immature, inactive state. Not only are they inactive, that they're not producing milk, but they're immature. They're not capable of producing milk. However, when a female becomes pregnant or is presented with pregnancy hormones, those glands will mature and become capable of producing milk. I make a point of emphasizing that because one of the uh, I guess it's not a recent thing, uh, but one of the more common things that they do now with adoptions is uh, if a female is adopting a baby, one of the things that that female will do is start taking some pregnancy hormones to help her mammary glands to develop so that she's actually capable of breastfeeding the adopted infant. Now, typically, uh, this artificial activation of the mammary glands is not enough to fully sustain the baby. The baby is still going to require formula and things along those lines as well. But it does allow for a bonding activity between the adopted mom and the adopted a child. So it is something that more and more women are starting to do when they're doing adoptions to uh, add to that intimacy, add to that bonding experience. All right. There you go, questions on those. And again, obviously, ceruminous glands, mammary glands are sudoriferous glands. So that means they're simple coiled tubular glands. They use the Merocrin mode of secretion. However, as we also talked about, there is some question with the mammary glands as to if some of these mammary glands are actually using the epocrine mode of secretion. Remember we talked about with milk production, there's really two kinds of milk that mom produces. A form milk, which is much more watery, much more carbohydrate rich, and a hind milk, which is much more uh, viscous, much more um, uh, protein and lipid rich. Uh, and so they believe that it might be possible that uh, we may actually have two different types of glands in there using two different types of modes of secretion. So like I said, five years from now, we may be talking about that as a location for where we find epocrine a mode of secretion in humans, but it hasn't been confirmed yet and they don't wanna jump the gun the same way they did with the sweat glands. So like I said, for now, for our exam, there are no confirmed human examples of the epocrine mode of secretion. But this, if it is in the human body, this is likely where it is. All right, questions on that? Excellent. So just that easily, we have now finished our glands. How are we on time? Oh, we're doing awesome. Oops, stop that. 
All right, excellent. So the next thing we have to talk about, the next accessory structure is the hair. And for this, I want the whiteboard. We'll go through this once first on the whiteboard and then look at the pictures because there's some uh, a fair amount of vocabulary that I want to make sure we're uh, understanding. And also there are is, again, terminology that I want to make sure we understand. With a hair, hair is a structure. Uh, and again, stop me if you've heard this story before starts as a single layer of keratinocytes that divide rapidly producing new cells, pushing the old cells up uh, above them. As those cells move away from the dividing section, they fill up with keratin to the point that they uh, chuck their nucleus and they die, harden and fuse together, become a hardened, uh, dead, keratinized structure. The same way our skin grows is the exact same way that our hair grows. However, we do have the issue where that hair, being that dead, hardened, keratinized structure that is sticking out, is sticking out of the skin. And our skin is our protection, right? So it wouldn't be very protective if it had millions of little holes in it. So that hair is surrounded and supported. Oh, why is that not writing? is surrounded and supported by a structure known as the follicle. This follicle is basically an extension of the skin that wraps around the hair. So when we talk about the hair, we have to talk about the hair and we also have to talk about the follicle. But let's start easy. Let's start with the hair first. There are three regions uh, to a hair. Oops. The first of those regions, where's my drawing thing, uh, is the bulb. The bulb is the structure where we have the growth that is going to occur. So let's go ahead and draw that. So here is our bulb. Our bulb is where the growth occurs, a single layer of keratinocytes. And that single layer of keratinocytes is a structure known as the matrix. I think I'm gonna have to make this smaller to fit this all in here. So the matrix will draw in red. Oops, yeah, I guess that works. No, I don't want that. I want this. A single layer of keratinocytes. One of the interesting things about this matrix is while it's primarily keratinocytes, in there also are some cells that have long processes that stick out producing a pigment that it provides to the cells associated with it without keeping any of them for themselves. There are actually melanocytes in this matrix as well. And what do these melanocytes do? Give color. Give color to the hair. What's interesting about these melanocytes, obviously they're similar to the ones in our skin, but for some individuals, and there's a very strong genetic uh, component to this. But for some individuals, these melanocytes uh, stop producing melanin at some stage. And what happens when these melanocytes stop producing melanin? It's when you grow gray. Yeah, you get gray or white hair, those gray or white hairs that occur, right? Again, when this is all the hair you have on your head, you don't really care what color it is, but, um, those gray and white hairs are caused by the lack of production of melanin by these melanocytes. So why they stop, but it doesn't happen the same thing in the skin, or at least not as commonly. I mean, vitiligo is a autoimmune disorder where uh, your immune system destroys 
melanocytes. So obviously that can cause white patches to occur in the arm, but typically it doesn't happen the same way as it does with the hair. So the bulb is where the growth occurs, where the matrix is located. Uh, the hair itself then extends all the way up and out of the skin. Now, as many of you know, there are also three layers to the skin. Now that might not be the part that you necessarily know, but we'll get to this in a second. Three layers to the hair. And the outermost layer of the hair is this very dense, very tightly packed, heavy keratinized overlapping layer of dead keratinocytes, providing tremendous strength and integrity to the hair. Anyone know what that tough outer layer of the hair is called? Uh, hair shaft. Well, so, so when we're talking about regions, we are indeed talking about the part that we are going to call the shaft. So this is indeed the shaft portion. But what's special about the outer layer of the shaft? What is the outer layer of your hair? I know you guys know, even if you don't know, you know, because if this becomes damaged, right, you can get those horrible split ends that I worry about so much. Right, because when you only have five hairs, you want to make sure you take very good care of them. What is it that becomes damaged that causes you to get split ends? Come on, there's got to be somebody there who cares more about their hair than I do. I know you know, even if you don't know, you know. The minerals? Nope. The cuticle. The outer layer of your hair is your cuticle, right? You've heard that term before when people talking about maintaining the cuticles of their hair. Uh, if that cuticle becomes damaged, the hair splits. It turns out the shaft is the region where the cuticle is fully intact. It doesn't start intact. There is a portion of the hair where that cuticle is forming. So the part of the, of the hair where the cuticle is forming is called the root. And the part where the cuticle is completely intact is known as the shaft. Now, in reality, that a point occurs somewhere around two thirds of the way up the hair. There is a point. However, when we're looking at this on a model or a chart, is it going to be very easy to tell where the cuticle is intact and where it is not? No. No. So to sky is blue this for us, to make this a little bit simpler for us, the dividing point we'll just use as the surface of the skin. Because clearly, if the hair is outside, of the skin, then the cuticle has to be intact. And so that'll be the part that will be, we will consider the shaft. And then anything from the bulb to the surface of the skin, we will call the root, okay? Again, it's a little bit of an oversimplification, but I think it will serve our purposes. So I don't assume anybody will have too much of a problem with us making the answer to this a little easier. Uh, if you do, then fine, you can find the dividing point. But know that if I point to anything down here, I mean the root and anything up there would be the shaft. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. So those are the three regions of a hair, the shaft, the root, and the bulb. There are also three layers to the hair. So let's draw those. Layer one, layer two, and since I did it brown for the last one, layer three. Now, I've already told you what the third layer is. The third layer is indeed that heavily keratinized cuticle. 
So then that brings us to the two other layers. This is an organization we are gonna see a lot. Often, and actually let's cheat and move the cuticle out of the way for a second. Because I wanna make a point of emphasizing this. In the human body, there are gonna be a lot of instances where we are going to see structures that have a chewy nougat center and a candy coated shell, an inner layer and an outer layer. Uh, the adrenal gland, the kidneys, lymph nodes, right? It goes on and on, lots and lots of bone, lots of places that we will use this. And so these are terms that are very, very commonly used for these situations. When we have this type of organization, the inside is referred to as the medulla. And anybody know what the outer layer is referred to as? Cortex. Yeah, exactly, cortex. So we will see this type of organization a lot in the human body, an inner medulla and an outer cortex. And our hair is that way as well. It has a medulla, it has a cortex. And then once it forms, it has this heavily keratinized cuticle on its outer surface. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. So that is the hair, the regions of the hair and the layers of the hair. But there's one more thing I need to draw on this picture over here. No, Professor, I did have a question. Oh yeah, um, go ahead. So you're saying the cuticle is like the hardened, keratinized, dead, the and then the medulla is the soft inner. Now is that obviously that's still keratinized cells, dead, and everything. Yes. Just softer. You are correct. The hair is made up of keratinocytes. So the medulla, the cortex, and the cuticle are all made up of keratinocytes. But here, and I jumped ahead a little on the slides, but I love this picture. Uh, and again, anytime I say I love this picture, you should always expect to maybe see it on the exam. But what I love about this is this is an electron microscopy view of the hair. Right? Normally, when you pull that hair out of your head and you look at it with the naked eye, or even when you look at it under the microscope, that outer cuticle looks like a smooth, hardened, uh, continuous layer. But here, with an electron microscope, we can see this cuticle is made up of these very thick, very dense, very hard, overlapping layers of keratinocytes, kind of like the shingles on your roof. It is a huge, massive, strong, protective outer layer. Big, rough, right? When we look at it at the electron microscope. Naked eye level looks smooth, but it is a big, huge, thick, heavily keratinized outer layer. So yes, all of these are keratinocytes, but the cuticle cells are heavily, heavily keratinized. All right, I guess you could almost think of it the same way a callus is like where we've really pressed the cells together and made them really, really hard. Well, that's kind of what's happening with the cuticle. And like the difference between like a fine hair and a coarse hair would just be the uh, amount of compression? Uh, possibly, although what's interesting is one of the, what's, what's really interesting about the hairs, one of the major factors that determines the consistency of the hair whether it's fine, whether it's coarse, whether it's straight, whether it's curly, is actually the shape of the follicle. The shape of the follicle as the hair comes out uh, actually can affect the composition of the hair as well. So yeah, so it's a, a little more complicated than just that, but sure. I, I'm guessing someone who had a thicker cuticle would probably have coarser hair as well. All right, excellent. Let's... Go back, where were we, the whiteboard. All right, so this is the hair. Uh, it's three layers and it's three regions. And remember, it sticks out of the skin and that means it also sticks through the epidermis. I make a point of emphasizing this because remember, we don't want it to just be a hole in our skin that harmful things can get through. 
So what ends up happening is our epidermis will actually extend down and around the hair forming the follicle. So the follicle, or the inner parts of the follicle are actually an extension of the epidermis. Which means they're what type of cells again, or what type of tissue again? What type of tissue is the epidermis? Keratinized stratified squamous. Yeah, exactly. It's an epithelial tissue. Right, and you're right. It is the keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, but it's an epithelial tissue, which tells us two things. It is cell dense and it is avascular. Now, there are two layers to this epithelial extension. The inner one, right along the surface of the hair, is what is known as, and here, let's actually, because my drawing's getting a little poor here. Let's see if we can look at it here. So notice here, as we look, we have our medulla at the center here. We have our cortex here, and we have our cuticle. We have our three layers to the hair there. And then notice as we look beyond that, we have this light pink region here, which represents what is known as the internal root sheath or internal epithelial root sheath. And then the thicker outer layer, which is the external epithelial root sheath. So notice if we go back to our drawing, we have three layers to our hair and we have three and a half layers to our follicle. black and make big. So we have, I guess I'll do circles again. Oh, why are these purple? An inner epithelial root sheath. And anytime you have an inner something, you're going to have an outer something as well. Oops, that stays there. This is so much easier to do when I'm just on the whiteboard and uh, I have my markers. But uh, say lovey. Again, calling them the inner root sheath and the outer root sheath are fine. I like putting the epithelial in there because it reminds me that these are extensions of the epidermis. And it also reminds me that they are both cell dense and a vascular. Which brings us to our third layer, right? Our third layer, if all of these epithelial cells are here, we need some type of connective tissue some extension of the dermis that is going to wrap around all of this to provide the oxygen and the nutrients and everything else that we need as well. So what's gonna happen is some of our dermis is going to condense on the outer surface, forming what we call the connective tissue or dermal root sheath. And it forms one other thing as well, right? After all, this matrix are keratinocytes that are dividing rapidly. So they need a lot of oxygen. They need a lot of nutrients. They produce a lot of wastes. So there is actually an extension, a finger-like extension 
of the dermis that sticks up into that bulb, and that is known as the dermal papillae. Bringing the capillaries, bringing the blood vessels up to that. It's Questions been described as the, it, it, in, in the book and everything, it says uh, hair papillae, like are those yeah. interchangeable or do you want us to have just- No, hair papillae would be fine as well. Hair papillae would be fine as well. Both would be fine. It's an extension of the dermis. It's for the hair. They're, they're both appropriate anatomical terms. Questions on this? Come on, someone's got to have a question on this. I have a question on this. I said three and a half. Oh, three and a half. There you go. Notice one last thing. As I mentioned, the internal and outer, internal and external, sorry, in, in, internal and external. Why did I say inner and outer? Internal and external. Sorry. Internal and external uh, epithelial root sheaths are epithelial tissues. We know they're avascular. We know they are cell dense. We also know that they're polar. They have an apical surface that would face towards where the hair would be. And they have a basement membrane. Now, remember I said basement membrane is glue that you're never going to see except for one exception. And this is the one exception. In many, not all, but in many of our hair follicles, it is actually possible to see that acellular glue between the epithelial root sheaths and the connective tissue root sheaths. And they've given a very fancy name uh, to this basement membrane located here. So make sure you use this fancy name. And the fancy name that they've given to it is the glassy membrane. It really is just a fancy way of saying basement membrane. And this is one of the places where we see it. Now, again, I've made a bit of a mess with this picture. I will save it so I can post it on our website for us, but let's look at some better examples. Here again, notice we see all of those distinct levels, medulla, cortex, and cuticle for the hair, internal epithelial root sheath, external epithelial root sheath, basement membrane, and the connective tissue or dermal root sheath. We see it nicely in the cross section. And notice they've done a pretty good job of showing us it here in a, a cross section or really a longitudinal section, I should say, of the hair. Notice we can here see that dermal papillae coming up the matrix of the bulb around it. Here we see that same thing on this here, but let me show you where they've shown it to us probably the best. Notice here, this particular model, right, has done an amazing job of showing all of this to us. Notice we see the medulla of our hair here in white. Here we have the cortex. Here we have the cuticle. And notice that dark cuticle continues all the way up for the hair out to the shaft. But then it also has the follicle layers, internal epithelial root sheath, external epithelial root sheath, glassy membrane, dermal or connective tissue root sheath. We see it really nicely on these models. Of course, you're thinking it, that can't be what it looks like under the microscope, but indeed it is. In fact, if we cheat, and let's go back to that picture we were looking at with our pseudoriferous gland. 
and pardon me, sebaceous gland. Notice here, if we look at our sebaceous gland, clearly the hair is not here. We do not have a hair. So there's no cuticle, there's no medulla, there's no cortex. But notice this fuzzy part right here is the internal epithelial root sheath. This darker part out here is the external epithelial root sheath. Notice how cell dense they are. And then notice if you look closely, you see this clear layer on the outer surface. This is that glassy membrane. And then this very fibrous part wrapped around it here, this is the connective tissue or dermal epithelial root sheath. So notice while we don't have the hair, we can see all four layers of the follicle on this picture. So you absolutely are responsible for this histologically. You are responsible for it on a chart, on a model, on an illustration, because we can all see these things clearly on these locations. All right, questions on that. And that, that connective, the uh, connective tissue on, on the hair, is that the uh, dense irregular? Uh, yes, it's the dense irregular. Absolutely. I wonder, I thought I had maybe, no, I don't. I don't have another picture. I, actually, I think I do have another picture in a different place. We'll look at it in a minute. But so, okay, a lot of vocabulary. So let's go through it all again with the hair. We've drawn it, but let's take a look at it here. Again, hairs, both primary and secondary. And again, there are all sorts of different types of hairs, different growth patterns for your hairs, right? There's the hair on your skin, on your head. There's the uh, hair on your forearm, there's your eyelashes that are hair, secondary hair, right, pubic hair. All of these hairs have different growth rates, different characteristics to them. We are, we are painting with broad strokes here. But in general, as we mentioned, there are three regions to the hair. The shaft, where the keratin is complete. The root, where the keratin is forming. And notice, as I mentioned, that boundary is normally about two thirds of the way up the hair. Uh, but for simplicity's sake, we're just gonna use the skin as our boundary. Above is gonna be the shaft, below will be the root. And then we have the bulb. The bulb is where the matrix is located and the papillae. Now, again, you may never have thought of uh, this before, but this one little matrix right here is where our hair grows, which is why if the first thing you do in the morning is come in and shave, all you do is remove the very top of the hair. So what happens as a result of that? Grows more. Yeah, well, not only does it grow more, but by five o'clock, it's already starting to show. So maybe you don't want to shave every day. What could you do instead? Come on, there's 20 of you here. Someone must have waxed before. Yeah. There you go, exactly. When you wax, basically what ends up happening is you are tearing the hair down here somewhere where the keratin is not complete. So basically somewhere in the root, this becomes cut, cut and basically is pulled out. Notice now it takes a lot longer instead of hours, it takes days or weeks for it to fully grow back, but the hair comes back. If I wanna make this hair go away forever, what do I have to do? Laser. Kill the hair papilla. I have to kill, well, not just the papillae, although the, I guess killing the papillae would work as well, but what I need to do is I need to kill that matrix. If I kill that matrix, then the hair doesn't grow back. How do they typically do that these days? Laser hair removal? Yeah, laser hair removal. With laser hairs, they're able to penetrate the skin, uh, destroy that matrix, and make that hair stop growing. Back in ancient times, and I mean ancient times, I mean 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, they used a process called electrolysis. Anybody know what electrolysis is? 
You're also uh, using electricity to break a bond. Yeah. Basically, what they would do is they would take a very thin needle, insert that needle into the hair follicle, and then generate an electrical signal. And that electrical signal would destroy the matrix and the papilla. And then they would withdraw the needle and they'd move to the next hair. Yes, hair removal was one hair at a time. Take a quick gander at your forearm. Just imagine how many hours you had to sit in the chair just to remove the hair from one forearm, right? The things we do for beauty, right? But of course, as we know, the only thing that matters is how beautiful you are on the outside, right? What's inside doesn't matter at all. So you can understand why people would sit for hours and destroy their hairs in such a fashion, right? All right, questions on that? Yes, like always. Um, so with like Nair and stuff like that, when it's like chemicals, does that go down and? Chemicals in the same way, like waxing, basically what they do is they destroy the hair where the, the cuticle is incomplete. Where the cuticle is incomplete, the hair is much more fragile. So it's easier to basically dissolve that away. And then so that when you wipe the, when you wipe the skin, it takes the hair with it. Typically, it doesn't penetrate deep enough to damage the papillae. So again, just like with waxing, the hair does come back. Uh, and like with waxing and like with Nair, whether it's a chemical or whether it's the abrasive of the wax, remember, you're still stimulating the skin, causing epidermal growth factor to be produced, which causes the hair to grow back faster as well. But you still get a couple weeks of uh, of smooth skin so with laser removal it's it destroyed the full uh, yeah with laser the goal is to destroy the matrix and if you destroy that matrix then that hair is never growing back so yeah that is the goal now again is it 100 percent perfect where it's going to be able to get all of them perfectly and completely destroy all of the matrices no so there can be some additional hair that will eventually grow back in those areas. But typically you go back and reapply it and, and eventually they're able to get it all. It is much more effective. Well, it's not, let me rephrase that. It's not more effective than the, the electrolysis. Electrolysis is highly effective. It's just very slow and very painful. So if you can get 90% of the hairs with a slip, you know, with a quick slip, this quick swipe of a, ra of a laser, then that's much more efficient. You can do larger portions of the body, even if it takes multiple sessions to completely remove all of them. All right. So somebody, so somebody going bald is basically just their hair matrix dying. Uh, so again, for male pattern baldness and things along those lines, typically what they have found is uh, certain androgens, male hormones, so that's why male pattern baldness is much more common in males, uh, leads to a thinning of the matrix. So it causes the matrix to thin or the papillae to decrease in size. So less blood is brought to the area. The matrix thins as a result of that. And either very small, tiny, thin hairs are produced or the hair can stop to be produced entirely. Yes, yeah, so that is the most common type of baldness because of a shrinking of the papillae, a shrinking of the matrix, a shrinking of the size of the hair or the ultimate elimination of the hair. Yep. All right, questions on that. So we did the regions, now we've done the layers. We talked about the cuticle and it's big, rough, tough outer exterior. And then again, the internal and external epithelial root sheath, the glassy membrane, and that dermal or connective tissue root sheath. The basically three and a half, four layers to the follicle. All right, that is the hair and the hair follicle. As we've also mentioned, sebaceous glands are associated with our hairs as well. But the other structure that we haven't talked about yet is this fella right here, the erector pili muscle. The erector pili muscle is smooth muscle. 
What's the implication with that? What's the biggest difference between smooth muscle and skeletal muscle? Well, one is automatic one. The smooth muscle is not automatic. It's, it's... Well, you get the right idea. It's involuntary. Smooth muscle, we can't consciously control, right? I have skeletal muscle in my finger and I say move and it moves, right? I can't do that with my smooth muscle, right? When you had that cheeseburger for breakfast, you didn't have to tell your stomach to start churning, right? What is the function of these erector pili muscles? Uh, it says it in the name, it's erect. Make there your you hair stand up. Absolutely. Like the drawing that I did, like this picture here, uh, our hairs are typically at an angle, which allows them to lay down. But that erector pili muscle, when it pulls on, it does two things. It pulls the hair so that the hair stands upright and that muscle bulges. And when it bulges, typically we get a little enla enlargements of the skin, what we commonly refer to as goosebumps as a result of that. Excellent. So that is what it does. So now the question becomes why? Why do these erector pili muscles function? Well, let's think about it. When does your hair stand up on end? When do you get, get goosebumps? When you're cold. When you're cold and when else? Scared, excellent, when you're cold and when you're scared. Let's talk about cold first, right? How many people here have ever been scuba diving before or worn a scuba suit? A Couple of you, excellent, Brian. Is the goal of that scuba suit to keep the water away from your body? No. No, in fact, it's the opposite. When you go scuba diving, you actually take water and put it in your scuba suit. Why? If its job isn't to keep you dry, what does that scuba suit do? To keep the temperature? Yeah. The insulation. Exactly. It keeps you warm. What happens is water has this ability to draw heat away from us. So if you were there just in your speedo inside the ocean, right, the cold water of the ocean would be coming across the surface of your body and stealing your body heat. When you put the water in the scuba suit, the water still steals your body heat, but the scuba suit keeps that water next to you, doesn't let the water leave. So it keeps the warmth close to you and it helps you to maintain your body temperature. This is exactly what happens with uh, like Siberian Huskies, right up in Alaska for the Iditarod. They have really long hair that stands up on end and it captures the air keeping the air close to their body, helping them to maintain their body temperature. So that must be what it does for us, right? On a nice cold winter day, you step outside to get the newspaper off your front yard and the door accidentally locks behind you. And there you are outside in your pajamas. And the problem is you don't wear pajamas. So it's winter, you're naked outside, but suddenly your hair stand up on end and as a result of that, you're not cold anymore, right? Is that what happens? No. No. The evolutionary process is there, right? It's just not very effective for us because we're just not that hairy, right? This used to be where I'd make a Robin Williams joke because he's like the hairiest person I know, but he's dead now, so it's not tasteful, so I won't do it anymore. All right. What's the other reason that someone said, oh, you're scared. Your hair stands up on your scared. Why? Well, fight or flight. Sort of, part of it's fight or flight, but let's take it back to your cat. What does your cat do when it's scared? No one's ever seen a scared cat before? Run away? Can, but what if it can't run away, what does it do? It lifts its body. Yeah, it raises its back and its hair stands up on end. Why? To look bigger. So it looks bigger, so it looks scarier, absolutely, right? And is that what happens with you? You've got that significant other that you're taking out on a date. 
Suddenly a mugger comes out and pulls a gun on you. Your hair stands up on end. They get intimidated by how big you are and they run away. No. no. Again, we have these uh, uh, evolutionary processes in place. They're not as effective for us as they are for the cat or for uh, the Siberian Husky, but we still have those processes there. And they still work when we're scared, when we're cold. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't serve any function for us because notice one more thing as well. These erector pili muscles are also associated not just with the hair, but with the sebaceous glands. So what happens is when these erector pili muscles contract, they can help to secrete that sebum, push the sebum out of that sebaceous gland and keep the secretion process going. So yes, they stand up when we're cold. Yes, they stand up when we're scared. Not super effective for us, but it happens. But they do serve an important function in helping in the secretion of the sebaceous glands. Now, there is one more structure we need to talk about for the hair. It's one of those things that's horrible in the way that it's named because part of it's really good and part of it's silly. Let's start first with the term plexus. A plexus is an elaborate network. And in particular, and in this case, it's an elaborate network of nerves. This one happens to be the hair root plexus, because guess where this elaborate network of nerves is located? Hair root. Exactly, around the bulb of the hair. Wait, what? Yeah, it's around the bulb. I know, it's called the hair root plexus, but it's actually around the bulb. Any idea what this nerve that wraps around the bulb might do? Sensory, sensation. Like, exactly, uh, right? If a bug lands on your arm and can you, it just touches your hair of your arm, can you feel that? Yeah. If while you're paying 100% attention to me, your loved one were to come over and grab one of the hairs on your forearm and pull it out, would you be aware of it? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so movement, pain, Right, those types of sensations of the hair, that's what the hair root plexus provides us. Right, tells us when the hair is touched, tells us when the hair is moved, tells us when the hair is yanked out, provides that sensory information about the hair. All right, the hair itself, remember, is dead, but the follicle has this nerve around it that tells us, right? So again, someone cuts your hair, you're not aware of it, but if they yank it out, they, you are because of the hair root plexus. All right, I know we've gone a little long, but let's finish this one because it'll be super quick. Stop me if you've heard this story before. You have a single layer of keratinocytes that divide rapidly, producing new cells that push them up. As the cells move further away, they fill with keratin, fusing together, become a thick, hardened structure until ultimately they get to the end where you chew them off. The same way your hair grows, the same way your skin grows is exactly the same way your nails grow. And it all starts with that single layer of cells, the matrix. And just like the hair, if you damage the matrix, what happens? Stop growing. Yeah, I, uh, in third grade, uh, was carrying, uh, again, I was, Grew up back east, so we had things like fireplaces and things like basements. I was carrying some logs coming up from the basement, tripped and fell. The logs fell on my thumb, and I ended up damaging my thumb and lost my thumbnail. My thumbnail came off. Luckily, I didn't damage the matrix, and the nail grew back. My wife's best friend has twins, and she was putting them in the car one day, and as she closed the door, one of them had their finger in the door and smashed her pinky finger, damaging the nail matrix. And guess what happened? Never grew back. The nail didn't grow back. Bright side, she can now tell the two of them apart, but 
by damaging that matrix, you or she's that nail stopped growing. So again, the same way the hair grows, the same way the skin grows is exactly the same way the nail grows. What's the function of the nail? What do you use your nails for? Scratching. Yeah. Picking up things. Scratching, gr grasping, grasping, picking things up, protection, all of those types of things. Absolutely. Popping the can on your beer, all of those important things. And it has some basic anatomy. We have the nail matrix again down at the bottom that it grows, feeding into the root, which feeds into the body. Again, this is an extension of the epithelial tissue. So notice, especially at the base, this epithelial tissue is much deeper. Because it's much deeper, less blood vessels can be seen. So you'll notice at the base of your nail, there is a lighter a region underneath the nail known as the lanola. Because the primary color that you see of your finger under the nail is your blood. How do you know that? Squeeze it. If you squeeze your nail and look at it, what you'll see is you can actually move the blood out of there. It gets white in color and then the blood rushes back in. Now, again, this is one of those things that I always feel very silly that I have to say, but apparently I have to say this because a couple semesters ago, I had a student who squeezed her nail and got very upset because she didn't see the blood move out. She didn't see the change in color. And it turned out it's because her nails were painted. So if your nails are painted, you won't see the blood change in your nail. But as long as your nail's not painted, then when you squeeze it, you'll see the blood go out of there and you'll see the color come back. So that really happened. Uh, lighter <laughs> lighter uh, region at the base is the lanula. This nail, again, is protected by the epithelial tissue, but it still is a potential opening to the outside world. So it has to be protected and it's protected by some additional folds of uh, keratinocytes providing that protection. One of them here at the base is what we commonly refer to as the cuticle. And at the distal end, there's a thickening of the tissue, what we commonly refer to as the nail bed. However, this is an anatomy and physiology class. Are we gonna get away with terms like cuticle and nail bed? Absolutely no. not. The cuticle is what is known as the eponychium, and the nail bed is what is known as the hyponychium. These are important structures helping to maintain the integrity, keeping harmful bacteria out. I mention this because thankfully it is a practice that has mostly gone away. But for a while, like 70s and 80s, one of the things that people would often do is cut off the cuticle. Because if you cut off the cuticle, more of your nail was exposed. Your nail looked longer and prettier when you got your nails done getting your mani and pedi. The problem with that is it exposed more of your body to the outside world and dramatically increased the likelihood of um, infection and bacterial infection and problems along those lines. Now, they will still kind of push the cuticle back to show that, but they don't typically cut it off the same way that they used to do. So hopefully nobody's still doing that anymore. I know the practice has gone down dramatically. All right, questions on that? Again, I apologize for going a little long, but that is the end of the anatomy and I wanted to get through that. So the good news is we are now done with the anatomy we're going to be responsible for, and we can focus the rest of the time on the physiology associated with the skin. Like I said, a lot of this is going to be review, synthesizing information that we've already talked about. Uh, but uh, there is a couple more new things we need to talk about as well, kind of our healing processes, which we'll finish things off with. All right, it is 930 now. So our next step is to go, like I said, into the physiology of the integumentary system, but I'll go ahead and leave this picture up for now when we take our break. Let's take a 15 minute break. So I will restart at 9.45. And at that point, I will start the recording again. All right, any questions before we take our first break? 
All right, see you guys in 15 minutes. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, like I said, we are gonna talk now about the physiology of the integumentary system. Many of these are concepts we've already talked about. Just wanna make sure we fully appreciate and understand all of these concepts. Uh, let's talk about one related to something we've been talking about, but obviously uh, we're gonna add a little bit more information to it. And that is skin color. You guys did a great activity where you looked at uh, the uh, explanation of the variations in skin color. Uh, that we talked about. And as we also mentioned, uh, one of the primary pigments of the skin is what pigment? Melanin. Melanin, excellent, right? And what produces melanin? Melanocytes. Uh, right. Remember, as we talked about, pretty much everyone has the same number of melanocytes. Where they're primarily different is both in the amounts of melanin that they produce and the color of the melanin that is produced. We talked about how there are genes that lead to that variations, lighter colored and darker colored. But as we also talked about, environment affects that as well. Do you spend more time outside versus spending more time inside? All of those are things that can modify and affect it. <clears throat> and is melanin coloration something that changes instantaneously? The second I walk outside into the sun, suddenly I get three shades darker because all of my melanocytes produce melanin instantaneously as a result of that? No. no. Uh, so while uh, color, color can change by the amounts in the, the, in the environment, it is a slow process for that. Similarly, another important pigment is the pigment carotene. Carotene happens to be a precursor of vitamin A. What color is the carotene pigment? Orange. Yeah, it is a yellowish orange color. Uh, carotene primarily comes from our diet, right? And uh, it, unlike melanin, which we saw is stored in the deeper layers of our skin, carotene is actually typically stored either in the superficial layers of the stratum corneum or deeper in the adipose uh, below the surface of the skin. Now, carotene is important not just because it plays a role in helping to color our skin, but it is also a precursor to vitamin A. And anybody know what vitamin A is important for? For your eyes, for vision? Yeah, absolutely, for vision. Vision is very dependent on vitamin A. Right, so it's important that we get carotene in our diet. And where does that carotene typically come from? Carrots. Yeah, it's in the name. Carrots or yellow bell peppers or things along those lines, right? It's why you never see bunny rabbits wearing glasses. Right? They eat lots of carrots, they have great eyesight. Excellent. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned, this is typically not a major coloration of our skin, but it can be, especially if you get massive amounts of it. Uh, if you look at people like Jack LaLanne, who became very, very prominent juicers, for instance, if you get people who do a lot of juicing, uh, all of that concentration of the pigments into those juices can be stored in their skin, and it does tend to give them a bit of more, more of a yellowish or orange coloration to it. Uh, about seven, eight years ago, ironically teaching summer school, I had a student who had a six-year-old son who decided that he was gonna eat nothing but carrots. And so for two weeks, he ate nothing but carrots. And as she showed to us by bringing in a picture to the class, he took on a nice, beautiful orangish hue to his skin because he decided he was gonna eat nothing but carrots for a couple of weeks. So absolutely, again, this is something that can affect and influence the surface of, our, of the color of our skin, but it isn't something that can dynamically instantly change. Is it possible to instantly and dynamically change our color of our skin? Like permanently or temporarily? Not permanently, uh, temporarily, dynamically, dynamic changes. If uh, yeah. a bear yeah, with hand. an ax, if a bear with an ax walked into the room, would there be likely a change in the coloration of the skin of your face? If yeah, you go. Hey, I came, yeah, if I came moseying up to you at a bar with my cheesiest pickup line, right, and then you slap me across the face, would there be a dynamic change of a handprint suddenly appearing on my face as a result of that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, right? And why is that? 
What's the pigment involved there? The blood, the hemoglobin. There you go, exactly, hemoglobin, right? Absolutely, heart rate changing in the blood flow to different areas, all of those things. That red pigmentation of our skin also can influence skin color. Now, again, some of this is genetic. Some people's arteries are a little closer to the surface of their uh, skin, the surface of their body. So they tend to have a more reddish coloration to their skin. Others are deeper or maybe their veins are a little closer. So they may have more of a whitish or even a bluish coloration to their skin. So where the blood vessels are located can influence skin color, but changes in blood flow, large amount of blood coming to an area, right, can cause it to become very red. Uh, a large amount of blood moving out of an area can cause it to become very white or very blue. And the reason that these kind of things are important is skin color can give us a huge indication of what's going on in your body. What color is your skin if you become cyanotic? Come on, I know someone must know. Yeah, a bluish coloration to the skin. What could be causing that? Lack of oxygen. Absolutely, one of the things could be the fact that someone's holding a bag over your head, right? You're not allowing you to get the oxygen that you need would cause a bluish coloration, a loss of oxygen uh, to that. What else could cause a cyanosis? When, does, when else do people tend to get on a bluish coloration to their skin? When death or when they explain? Bruise. Okay, bruise, when you get the, the, the rupturing of the blood vessels there. Where else? I was thinking. When you get cold. Cold, absolutely. Shiver. When we get cold, and this is one of the things we'll talk about, our blood in our skin plays a very important role in helping us to regulate our body temperature. When we're cold, the blood vessels in our skin contract to bring the blood back to the core of the body, to protect our internal organs. And that tends to make the outer surface of our skin more, uh, you know, has less oxygen rich blood in it. So it tends to take a more bluish coloration. Uh, some of the places you see that especially are like, for instance, in the lips where the blood vessels are very close to the surface. Excellent. Conversely, what color is someone's skin if they're erythemic? Red. Red. We all got up and ran around the room 16 times. Our blood vessels would dilate, bringing more blood to the surface of the skin to radiate it off, right? Or it could be affect emotionally, right? Normally when we do these bone presentations, you actually have to come to the front of the class to give it. And when your group comes to the front of the class and you start talking, if your pants suddenly fell down, would be, there be a change in the coloration of the skin of your face due to a change in blood flow? Yep. Yeah. And another great example, especially now that it's summer, is sunburn. When someone gets sunburn, that red coloration to their skin is actually caused by a congestion of blood in that area. I want you to test this. For science, this is for science. But the next time a loved one in your family has a really sunburned back, what I want you to do is take your hand and push it very firmly against their back. And when you do that and remove it, what you will see is actually a white handprint on the surface of their skin. Because by pushing on it, you've moved the blood out of that area and then the blood rushes back in. Do that four, five, six times. Again, explain to them it's for science and they won't mind. All right. <clears throat> Questions on that? I have a question, but it's not on this. I had a question on how then do uh, birthmarks or like beauty marks have like form? Great question. Uh, so there can be uh, there can be several ways that that can occur, but the two most common are either uh, variations in blood flow. So that areas have uh, more blood in that area than others, or what tends to happen is you get more of an accumulation of melanocytes in that region. So what happens is, especially with more light, typically those things tend to be more distinct. Uh, again, a freckles is a, a lesser 
example of that kind of thing with a, with a, uh, with a, a birthmark. All right, obviously the more sun someone gets during the summer, their freckles tend to come out more because their melanocytes are producing more melanin than in the winter. Uh, but with uh, birthmarks, it tends to be a higher con uh, congestion of melanocytes in those areas. So typically it is a, a congestion of blood in that area or it's a congestion of melanocytes in that area that make it more darker. There are some other things that can cause it, but those are probably two of the more common ones. That's a great question. Any others? All right, excellent. What color is someone's skin if they have jaundice? Yellow. Why? Why does the skin get yellow? Anyone know? Something in the liver. You're right, it has to do with the liver, but it has to do with a pigment called bilirubin. Bilirubin is actually a pigment that forms from the breakdown of red blood cells. When red blood cells are broken down and red blood cells only last for about 20, uh, 100 days. Remember, they don't have a nucleus, they're big bags of hemoglobin. And when we're breaking down that hemoglobin, one of the pigments that is produced is this bilirubin. This bilirubin further gets broken down in the liver uh, to produce basically two pigments, urobilin, uh, which is a yellow color that actually is released in our urine, causing the yellow coloration of our, of our uh, urine, and stercobilin, which is a brown pigment, which colors our feces. So when our liver breaks down this bilirubin as it's recycling the red blood cells, these pigments are released in from the body uh, and expelled as waste. However, if there is a problem with your liver, like you have been drinking vodka for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for 17 straight weeks, then as your liver stops functioning properly, you, it isn't able to break down all of that bilirubin. And as a result, bilirubin starts to build up in the blood, and that bilirubin in the blood gives us that yellowish, greenish coloration. Again, uh, places like the nail beds, places like the conjunctiva of the eye, uh, places like the lips are areas where it is much more prevalent and can be seen, but it can also be over the entire surface of the skin as well. Now, as I mentioned, liver damage or liver problems are one of the things that can cause jaundice, but what's the other condition where you see a lot of jaundice? Where else do you see a lot of jaundice? Come on, I know you know. True, when, when your jaundice and that uh, bilirubin builds up, some of it will be released in the urine, given the ur urine darker color. So like I said, alcoholics, people who have, 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 have hepatitis, those are people who typically show jaundice. What is another type of person who typically shows jaundice or can commonly be jaundice, at least for a couple of days? Babies. There we go. That's what I was looking for. Newborn babies. Fetal blood, the blood that the fetus has when it is inside of mom's body developing is has a massive amount of red blood cells in them. If you think of the metabolism and the growth uh, that takes place when you go from a single cell to the trillions of cells that is a baby, they need massive amounts of oxygen. And so not surprisingly, there's a massive amount of red blood cells in baby's blood. At the time of birth, a lot of those red blood cells die and are broken down. And the problem for newborn babies is that for many of them, the liver is not fully functional yet. And if the liver is not fully functional yet, that bilirubin can build up in their blood and the baby can be jaundice. Recent studies have shown as many as 30% of newborn babies show some level of jaundice in the first three days. The good news is that for the majority of them, it's not a big deal. 
typically John, uh, bilirubin levels follow a very, very uh, general pattern where they will spike a day or two after birth and then rapidly come back down. And as long as that occurs, that is fine. Where we have a problem is if the levels become too high or they stay elevated for a higher period of time. Because bilirubin can interfere with the development of the, of the nervous system. which is definitely a bad thing. So if the levels go too high or if it stays high for a prolonged period of time, they need to do something about it. And let's go back to ancient times. What would grandma do if the baby had jaundice? Bloodlet. Okay, grandma's not quite that hardcore. You're right, they would do that in some cases, but what did most grandmas do? Citrus. Say again? Give them some citrus? Possibly, but what, it, what, and that is something, you're right. Both of those things are things that they did in olden times to deal with jaundice, but there was something even less evasive that they would do. There we go. Uh, they would put them in the sunlight. Now, again, I'm not saying that they would put them out on the, you know, on the, uh, on the windowsill like a potted plant, but typically they would put them in front of a diffuse curtain so that they would get some indirect sunlight. The reason for this, it turns out, is UV radiation um, uh, converts bilirubin into a more easily digestible form. making it easier for the liver to break it down. Which is why if you go into any NICU in the country, you see that there is a massive number of windowsills where they can put all the babies. Okay. Is that what they have in NICUs? No. Uh, what do they do instead? Shelter. Well, no. They, Protect they, them. They have UV blankets. They have UV lights that they put the babies under to help in the breakdown of that bilirubin. Right? Having a bunch of windows would be really, really cool, but they have UV blankets and UV lights and things like that that they can use now. So there you go. Questions on that? All right, I think I have one more example. There we go. Carbon monoxide poisoning. What color does somebody get when they have carbon monoxide poisoning? What? They can, but actually even more than white. Does anybody, has anybody seen anybody who's had carbon monoxide poisoning before? Pink. Yeah, they get a pink coloration to the skin. Absolutely. As we talked about, hemoglobin is a protein found in the red blood cells made up of four subunits. And in those four subunits, they have a heme group. And what's special about that heme group is at the center of the heme is an iron molecule. This iron molecule is where our oxygen is able to bind. And when the oxygen binds to the iron, that is what gives the red coloration to the skin. After all, you have that Studebaker on your front yard and when the oxygen came in contact with the iron of the grill, it started to rust. And that fresh rust when it forms has that reddish coloration. What happens though, is that carbon monoxide can also bind to that exact same location. And the problem with carbon monoxide is that it has a higher affinity. Higher affinity is a fancy term, but basically all it means is that it binds easier to and doesn't like to let go. So if both an oxygen and a carbon, dioxide, a carbon monoxide are competing for that iron, the carbon monoxide is much more likely to bind than the oxygen is, and it doesn't like to let go. 
And the problem is that about 98.5% of your oxygen is carried to the tissues of your body by the hemoglobin. So if instead your hemoglobin is chock filled of carbon monoxide, your blood can't carry oxygen. You can't get oxygen to the tissues of your body and it can cause severe damage and even death. Now, that's why when someone has or is exposed to carbon monoxide, it's important to know that right away. And one of the easiest ways to know that is by the color. The same way that when oxygen binds to the iron, it gives our blood the red color. When carbon monoxide binds to the iron, it gives the skin a much brighter pinkish color. And that's so why if you or someone around you suddenly gets very pink, grab all of you people and get out into an open exposed space as quickly and as rapidly as possible. All right. So again, notice these dynamic changes in skin color can give us an important understanding about what's going on in the body. All right, questions on that? All right, let's talk about another concept we've mentioned a couple times, but can go more in depth about. Thermal regulation of the skin. What are the ways, plural, that our skin helps us to regulate body temperature. Evaporation through sweat. Excellent. One of the main ones is by uh, evaporation. Actually, let's go ahead and write this up here and make it bigger. Now, we can be a little more precise evaporation of watery sweat. And we know that watery sweat is produced by what? Sudoriferous glands. True, sudoriferous would be a good generic term. But we could be more specific because aren't there four types of sudoriferous glands? What's the specific sudoriferous gland that produces our watery sweat? Ephraim. Excellent. Excellent. Right, you get up and you run around the room 16 times and you look at your arm and you see that sweat on the surface of your arm. This is what we call our sensible sweat. It can be seen. It is produced by that eccrine gland. Remember, as we mentioned, you can produce up to eight liters of this in a 24 hour period of time. You don't want to produce eight liters of it, but we are capable of doing it. And when it evaporates away, it takes the heat with it and it is incredibly effective. However, I know we just came back from a break, but I'm guessing during the break, none of you ran around the room 16 times. So if you look at the surface of your arm right now, unless you're listening to this lecture outside, are you, do you see any sweat on the surface of your arm right now? No. no. That doesn't mean you aren't losing water. Remember, as we talked about, our skin is mostly waterproof, but mostly isn't all the way. Our skin is a tissue that contains interstitial fluid and that interstitial fluid can sneak through the, the, the cracks of the skin and evaporate away. Not a massive amount. It's only about half a liter during the course of a day. But that's because our skin is intact. As we talked about, if I had large burns over large portions of my body and I survived it, as we talked about, the two things you would have to worry about are pathogens getting in and water getting out. So when our skin is not intact, we can lose a lot more of that interstitial fluid. 
And this loss of interstitial fluid is what we call insensible, right? Because we don't feel it. So all of you are insensibly sweating right now, right? Uh, interstitial fluid is evaporating away from your arms as we speak in other parts of your body. And if you're wearing wool socks for some reason right now, you may also be sensibly sweating down there as well. So there's actually two types of, well, I notice also this one doesn't really play any role in temperature regulation. This does not play a role in temperature regulation. It's just the sensible sweating that plays a role in temperature regulation. Excellent. How else does our skin regulate body temperature? When you shiver, when it shivers and generates heat. Okay. We talked about how adipose provides insulation. As you mentioned, we have that shivering, but what actually causes the shivering when we are cold? I guess that'd be our muscles, yeah. Yeah, contraction of muscles. So you are absolutely correct. Muscle contractions play a huge role in helping us to regulate our body temperature. But are those muscles a part of our skin? No. Is there a muscle that tries, not very successfully, but tries to play a role in temperature regulation? Erector muscle. Yeah, so there is some muscle, the erector pili muscle, again, not very effective, but that is a muscle in our skin that will contract when we're cold to try to help to regulate body temperature. And again, the adipose provides insulation, our muscles contracting help to regulate temperature regulation. But remember, both of those things are not a part of the skin. There is actually one more thing of the skin. And in fact, ironically, it is the main component of the skin that helps us to regulate body temperature. Anybody know what that is? There you go, the blood vessels or we can think of it as our blood supply. The reason for this is our skin is what is considered a blood reservoir. This blood reservoir plays an important role in while we're sitting here calmly listening to class, the blood, a large amount of our blood is slowly chugging along inside of our skin. But if we were to get up and to start exercising, or as we talked about, a bear with an ax walked in the room, then we could constrict those blood vessels to send it to the heart, to send it to the lungs, to send it to the muscles, so we could be active. And they play a huge role in helping us to regulate body temperature. Let's think about this. We all get up and run around the room 16 times and our temp increases. When our temperature increases, what happens to the blood vessels of our skin? Expand. Yeah. Our blood vessels dilate. They expand, bringing more blood to the surface. Why do they bring the blood to the surface? To exhale the heat. Uh, yeah. Let off heat. To radiate away the heat. If your loved one just comes back from a 15 mile run, do you even need to touch their skin to feel the heat coming off of them? No, you can just get your hand close and you can feel that heat radiating off of their body as a result of it. So we bring that blood to the surface to get rid of that heat. Conversely, if we're outside for long periods of time and our temperature starts to decrease, what happens to the blood vessels there? They constrict. Yeah, our blood vessels constrict, they contract. And when they constrict as a result of that, they move the blood away from the surface. So that less heat 
radiates away and more heat is brought to the core of the body, yep, to those internal organs, excellent. That is great for helping to maintain your lung and your hearts and your livers and your spleens. However, if you're stuck on that mountaintop in the winter for a long period of time and the blood is continually being drawn away from your skin, then especially those distal areas like your nose, like your ears, like your fingers, like your toes, they are deprived of warmth, oxygen, nutrients for a prolonged period of time and exposed to those cold for a prolonged period of time and what can happen to those regions. Hypothermic. Yeah, frostbite, absolutely. They can be damaged, the cells can become necrotic, the cells can die and we call that condition frostbite. Awesome. I mean, frostbite's not awesome, but awesome that we figured out the concepts. Better there than being are. dead. That is true too, absolutely. So there you go. Large blood supply of our skin, blood flow changes in response to temperature. We did that. We talked about the difference between insensible and sensible pers uh, perspiration. And we even talked about the erector pillar muscles. All right, excellent. Questions on that? I don't think there's too much new information. I think these are concepts that we've talked about a fair amount. And the same thing is true for this next one. Actually, let's do this first. We have talked about a lot of different sensory structures as we talked about the different parts of the skin. What I think is a useful way of summarizing this information and making sure we understand it is to make a table. Again, if this were an essay question on the exam, this is not the way you have to present this information, but I find it useful for me to organize these things this way. So let's, hold on, let's do this first. So we are looking at the sensory structures of the skin and to help us to organize this information, we're gonna make a table. First, we are going to identify the name of the sensory structure. The layer slash sub layers uh, where they're located. And if appropriate, regions where there are higher concentrations. Actually, let's do this. Do that. And then obviously the third thing we need is the type of sensory information it provides. All right, I'll go first. Uh, first sensory structure that we talked about were those tactile cells, also known as the Merkel discs. Where Specifically, did we say we found tactile cells? What layer or sublayer? Lowest layer of the stratum basal. Excellent. So absolutely. So in the the layer would be the epidermis. But you're absolutely right. More specifically, in the stratum basal or stratum germinativum. Excellent. Now, for this one, was there a region or regions where there were a higher concentration of them? Yeah. Where? In your hands, hands, palms, feet. This one wasn't hands and feet. This one was hands and 
Some of them in shoulder. No. Hands and think of babies. Hands and. Oh, hands and mouth, uh, lips. Face, face, especially the mouth, absolutely. But for right now, we'll just put hands and face. You're right, thumbs are the most, lips are the most, but hands and face is okay. And what type of sensory information did these tactile cells provide for us? Fine touch. Yeah, that fine touch. I like fine touch, fine touch works. Also fine discrimination, that would be fine as well. Excellent. See how easy that was? No new information there. We have just, um, we have just uh, organized some of the information we've already learned. Which reminds me, wasn't there another second sensory structure that also gave us that fine touch and discrimination? Yeah. What was that? What sensory structure was that? Was that the lam laminal? Now, it wasn't the laminated one, but you're getting closer. It is one of our corpuscles. Which corpuscle? Remember, same function, same name. What type of corpuscle? Tactile. Tactile corpuscle gives us the same information as the tactile cell. Now, remember, this is the one that is the spell this one wrong. Messner's corpuscle, excellent. So Messner's corpuscles like tactile cells, tactile corpuscles like tactile cells give us fine discrimination, fine touch. The difference aside from the name is where they're found. Where are the tactile corpuscles found? The papillary layer of the dermis. Yeah, there you go. Layer of the dermis. Excellent. And was there a regions where they were more common? Same hands. Hands and, and now you can say it, Brian. Feet. There we go. Excellent. All right. What was one of the other sensory structures we identified so far in this class? Lamellated. The lamellar or lamellated corpuscles. Remember, these are the ones that are also called the Pacinian corpuscles. Excellent. So, in a second corpuscle, what type of information did they provide? Pressure. Yeah, these are the ones that are pressure. And again, pressure not being fine touch doesn't need to be near the surface. So where do we find these lamellar corpuscles or lamellated corpuscles? A reticular layer of the dermis. And remember also, they can even be as deep as the hypodermis, which again, technically isn't in the skin. So if you didn't say that, that would be fine. And those are pretty evenly distributed. So we don't have to worry about any regions for those. I can think of at least two more. Give me another sensory structure. Uh, hair root papilla. There you go. Hair root plexus. Right, elaborate network of nerves. Obviously, this is going to be found, as the name tells you, around the bulb of the hair follicle. Right. Again, that goofiness of it's called the hair root plexus when really it's around the bulb. And what information did that provide for us? It's just sensation of the hair. Yeah, I like that. Brushes again. I like sensation, that's fancy, but we can just say movement of the hair. That's fine as well. These are all pretty specialized sensory sensations. Wasn't there a more general sense receptor? Gave us more general touch sensations. Is it the epidermal dendritic cells? Great guess, no, but remember that one was actually one of the immune cells. That one's one providing body defenses. 
It was the one that doesn't have a special structure at the end of the nerve. And because it doesn't have a special structure at the end of the nerve, it's called a nerve ending. Free nerve ending. There you go. These are pretty tiny. So does anybody remember where I said we could find them? All over. Close, they're all over the body, but when it comes to layers and sublayers, these are found in both the epidermis and the papillary layer of the dermis. Typically, they're not deeper in this skin, although they can be. So actually, let's just say that, epidermis and dermis, all over. So epidermis and dermis. And remember, they gave us our general touch sensations, things like pain, things like temperature, uh, things like tickle, things like itch. All of these are characteristics, general uh, touch sensations that are provided by those free nerve endings. And there you go. Notice really no new information on this chart. All we've done is organize the bits of material that we've talked about for the sensory structures as we went through this. And I think those were all of them. Let's double check. Free nerve endings, Merkel discs, uh, tactile corpuscles or mesonous corpuscles, lamellated corpuscles, uh, hair root plexus, that's it. And again, let's do this. Since I did it for all the others, let's do it for this one as well. Do, 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 do. Tactile cell. There we go. Oops. Oh, well. I'll fix that later. There, free nerve endings, tactile cells, Merkel discs, tactile corpuscles, mesonic corpuscles, lamellated corpuscles, bacinian corpuscles, and the hair root plexus. So five touch structures, sensory structures provide an in our sense of touch of the skin. Notice the illustration here does a good job of showing some of these. Notice here, we see an example of one of those tactile corpuscles. Here's a lamellated corpuscle. Here's a great example of that hair root plexus. Notice here are some free nerve endings here and some free nerve endings here. Notice the one thing the picture doesn't show us are these tactile cells. The tactile cells, remember, are going to be up here inside of the epidermis up there like that. So this picture, most pictures, most models aren't gonna show these, uh, but the rest are things that we absolutely can see. And again, since we've got it, let's cheat and look here. All right? Notice this one does a good job of showing us a free nerve ending, a lamellated corpuscle, a bacinian corpuscle, and I believe the, uh, I'm sorry, tactile corpuscle. Uh, uh, which is the uh, Messner's. And I believe the other model, oops, wrong direction. Shoot. Well, I thought one of these had a hair root plexus. Guess not. Oh, well. maybe it's further on in the model. So it doesn't show that, but we see the other ones here. So those are locations where you can see those types of things. So like I said, really no new information here. We're just summarizing the stuff we've already talked about. All right, questions on that? Excellent. All right, so those are most of the physiology that we need to talk about for our skin. 
there is one more major physiological process we have to talk about for the skin. But really, this is while we're going to focus on this function in the skin, the important thing to remember is this is true for all tissues. After all, after all, all tissues can be damaged. And when they're damaged, they need to be repaired. For a tissue to be repaired, there are some major requirements that are necessary. First, we have to get rid of all of the damaged tissue and replace the tissue is there. And of course, to replace it, we need cells, because remember, uh, we need to bring new cells and new cells come from cells that are gonna divide. So we need to get those new cells divided and into the damaged area. And do we want to be doing this just willy nilly? Randomly yeah. and hope for the best? No, we need chemical signals, growth factors and hormones that are going to regulate the process and make sure it happens properly. Now, Again, we're focusing on skin right now, but this is true for all tissues. For all tissues, there are two major ways that a tissue can be repaired. The first is a process called regeneration. Regeneration is when a damaged tissue is replaced with the same type of tissue, right? If I were to fall while riding my bike and I scraped the superficial surface of my arm, those keratinocytes will be replaced with other keratinocytes. And at the end of the process, it's gonna look the same, it's gonna feel the same, everything's gonna be the same. However, if instead of falling and scraping my arm uh, riding my bike, if I were to take a cheese grater to my arm and go all the way down to the bone, is all of that going to heal back and look identical to the way it was before? No. No, because what happens there is a type of healing called fibrosis. Fibrosis is where the damaged tissue is replaced with a fibrous connective tissue. And is that fibrous connective tissue going to have the same look the same feel, the same function as the tissue that was there before? No. no. And so typically that fibrous connective tissue we refer to as scar tissue. Now, we have two healing processes. So how do we determine which one we're gonna do? Every time we heal, we flip a coin, heads regeneration, tails fibrosis, do they alternate taking days off? Monday we regenerate, Tuesday is fibrosis. Superficial or deep damage. So again, we want to be careful because superficial and deep definitely is one of the factors that determines that process in skin, but it isn't necessarily going to determine that process in other tissues. And that's, I think, where you've hit on one of the keys. Obviously, one of the keys to the difference is is the tissue type, which tissue type it is. The epithelial tissues we talked about are highly mitotic. Epithelial tissues typically heal, heal via regeneration. That dense irregular connective tissue underneath it tends to heal via fibrosis. So that's why for skin, a deep injury tends to scar and a superficial one tends to regenerate. But what about muscle tissue? Does muscle tissue regenerate or does it heal via fibrosis? Fibrosis. Always? So if I'm working out doing the curls for the girls and I damage that skeletal muscle, I pull a muscle in my arm and damage it, that's it. I'm gonna get a big, huge scar as a result of that? No. No, it'll heal via regeneration. So, but if a huge shark comes and takes my whole shoulder away, am I gonna be able to regenerate all of that skeletal muscle as a result of that? 
Mm -hmm. no. no. So notice sometimes it's the tissue type, but it's also the severity of the injury. If it's a minor injury to muscle, it can be regenerated. If it's a large injury to a muscle, then it is going to typically scar. Would it kind of yeah. just depend upon whether or not, like let's say in the epithelial tissue, if the matrix, you know, that first line, if, that, if those are gone, how could it rebuild itself? Right, so again, normally a scrape over the surface of my arm will regenerate. If instead of just falling on my bike, I get dragged across the entire surface of the gravel and I get that rug burn over the entire surface of my body, even if it's relatively superficial, is it likely to regenerate entirely? No, there could be some scarring from that. So the severity of the injury does influence it. But again, it's also the tissue type. Are there some tissues that no matter how minor the injury is, they don't regenerate? Yes. Give me two, the two main examples. Cardiac. Cardiac muscle and? The muscle in your eyes? Not a bad guess, no. Well, let's say that you happen to play Superman in a couple movies, pretty handsome guy, right? Living the life, you're out riding your horse one day and get bucked off the back, damaging your back, and you spend the rest of your life in a wheelchair. Why did that occur? Your spinal column? Yeah, nervous tissue. Nervous tissue and cardiac muscle are the two main tissues that do not regenerate. Once those tissues mature, no matter how minor the injury, they typically don't regenerate. All right, so again, tissue type, severity of the injury influence it. Again, I wanna make a point of emphasizing, this is true for all tissues. We are going to be focusing on skin to see regeneration and fibrosis, but these also occur in muscle. They also occur in nervous tissue. They also occur in other parts of the body and other types of tissues as well. So these two repair processes are true for all tissues. All right. Yeah, if you had an omnipotent stem cell, would you be able to? Well, isn't that the whole point? And again, I hate to keep using Christopher Reeves as an example because um, from, from all intents and purposes, he was a very nice, genuine guy. Uh, but when he was a movie star and he was famous, uh, one of the things he was also say famous for, besides being um, Superman in movies, is he was a huge, huge proponent of uh, PETA, right? The ethical treatment of animals until he had a spinal cord injury. And then he learned that one of the primary ways that, that they were looking at healing it was with transferring. The, the goal is to be able to take omnipotent stem cells, put those into a damaged body and have it replace, regenerate the tissue that was there. Now, are we at the point where we can do that yet? No, but is there a lot of money and research and time and effort going into that? Yes. And when we're starting that process, do we typically start that process with humans? No. So a lot of that research that's going on is going on in animals. And shockingly, after his spinal cord injury, he went from a huge proponent of PETA to a huge proponent of animal research and uh, donated tremendous amounts of money to many programs and many, uh, and many uh, projects to you know, hope to have that opportunity to be able to walk again. And unfortunately, he was not able to before he passed. But that doesn't mean that we aren't still working on it. There's tremendous amount of money and effort and time and research going into that in hopes that exactly that could happen, that we could take those stem cells, put them in the heart, put them in the nerves and have the nervous tissue, have the heart regenerate. So absolutely, that is the ultimate goal. All right, that's why we talked about some people house freeze their umbilical cord blood right? Umbilical cord blood has those omnipotent stem cells in it. 
so that when you have your baby, you freeze their, uh, their omnipotent stem cells so that maybe 30 years from now when they need a new liver or they fall off of their horse, then you have those stem cells that came from them that can be used to repair them. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. All right, questions on this? So again, we are going to be talking about and seeing these two processes in skin. Look at regeneration, look at fibrosis, but remember this is true for all tissues. We are right on schedule. This is right where I wanted to be. So I'm happy about this, we're doing well. So let's go ahead and take our second break. Uh, it is 1040, so let's come back at 11.50, uh, pardon me, not 11, at 10.55, and at 10.55, we'll talk about tissue repair, we'll be done with our physiology, and then with whatever time we have left, to seeing how much time we have left, we'll either talk a little bit about homeostatic imbalances, but I want to make sure we have time for a review as well. So we'll make sure we have time for review, and then we'll get to anything else we have a chance to get to as well. So 10.55, uh, we will restart. And I will start the recording at that point. All righty. Any other questions before we take our first break? All right. See you in 15 minutes. All right. Let's finish this off with the concept of tissue repair. Again, with tissue repair, there are two processes we're looking at, regeneration and fibrosis. And an easy place to see these two processes are in the skin. So the skin's our first organ system. It's a good place to see these two processes. So this is a good starting point for the entire concept of tissue repair. So let's start first with a superficial injury to the skin. As we mentioned, this would be uh, superficial, so the dermis would not be involved. It would only involve the epidermis. And as we talked about, epidermal, uh, epidermis is made up of epithelial tissues, which are highly mitotic. So in this case, it primarily heals via regeneration with the dermis not being involved. Now your book's got some pretty pictures, but we could also do this on the whiteboard as well to make some sense of this. We have our skin. And as we've talked about, we have a, a dividing point between the dermis and the epidermis. And again, as we know, it usually undulates. It has those papillae. But for our purposes, I think it's easier to just make it a little bit of a straight line because it makes the process a little bit more clear. Now, this is the dermis down here and the epidermis above, and we are looking at a superficial wound. So this would be one that just involves, well, let's cheat, hold on, uh, erase that, grab this, move it that way a little bit. Let's open this up, give myself a little bit more room to play. Excellent. Just involves the epidermis. So again, this is a superficial wound, epidermis only. And so it is gonna heal via regeneration. Now, remember, as we talked about healing processes involve chemical signals that help to control and tell the cells what to do. And as remember, when we talked about when you irritate, when you damage, when you harm the epidermis, it produces that hormone-like protein called epidermal growth factor. What epidermal growth factor primarily targets is it targets the stratum basal cells. That single layer of keratinocytes. So here's our stratum basal, cuboidal or columnar shapes, the ones that are rapidly dividing. 
and it stimulates these. Now, as we said before, it stimulates these to divide more rapidly and mature more rapidly. However, in the case here that there's an injury, it also causes these cells to do two other things. These cells get much, much bigger. And not only do they enlarge, but it turns out they get lonely. So what happens is these large cells start to migrate across the surface of the injury. Normally we think of the tissue, the skin growing upward, but in this case, it grows out. Looking for friends. So what happens here is our basal cell grows large, divides, and produces this big, large cell that grows across the surface of the skin. And then it divides and produces a big cell and grows this way as well. Notice also, I should have mentioned this before. Uh, so let's cheat and snick it up here. Oh, I can't fit it in between. All right, so we'll make it work up here. Notice also, because it only involves the epidermis, there is no bleeding. Uh, in this. Remember, the epidermis is um, epithelial tissue, avascular, so no vascularization. However, that doesn't mean that it won't uh, uh, ooze. It won't, uh, you know, have fluid coming out of it. That fluid that comes out of it is that interstitial fluid. So again, you can have some seeping where some of that interstitial fluid that we talked about will come out of the, out of the tissue so again, it can be a wet, moist injury, but it's not blood because it doesn't involve the dermis. Now, these stratum basal cells continue to divide, continue to enlarge, continue to migrate along the surface until they make contact with another cell. When the basal cell makes contact, with another cell, it changes its growth pattern. In this case, instead of continuing to grow outward, now, like it normally does, it starts to grow upward. This process where the cells change the direction by which they grow is what we call contact inhibition. Right? They were lonely, but now that they found a friend, they don't have to grow outward anymore. They can start to grow upward. And that's what they'll do. When they divide, they produce new cells. These new cells are further away uh, from the cells that were there before. So they're further away from the blood supply. They're not going to be, um, they're not going to be dividing anymore, but they will start to produce proteins, specifically desmosomes. So we'll start to get that formation of the stratum spinosum. These cells will then continue to move upward and away. And as they move upward and away, they form those flat layers. And let's cheat. Those dense flat layers where they're densely filled with granules forming the stratum granulosum. And assuming this is arm and this is thin skin, when these cells reach the top of this layer, they die. And when they die, they're just dead, fused together layers of hardened, flattened cells. We have our stratum corneum. And notice, lo and behold, we have regenerated the tissue that was there. The tissue that is there now is the same as the tissue that was there before, looks the same, feels the same, appears the same, functions the same, and we have fully regenerated the tissue. Right? We did this very simply here on the board. 
but your book does a really nice job of showing this process as well. Again, this includes superficial injuries like abrasions and first degree burns. Again, we need a chemical signal. We need a chemical signal that is going to regulate this process and it's that epidermal growth factor because it's only involving the epidermis. This is a superficial wound. Whoops, wrong button. That epidermal growth factor targets the basal cells, causing them to enlarge, causing them to grow outward in that process of migration, but they don't migrate forever. Eventually they come in contact with another cell, forming that contact inhibition, and that changes the growth pattern so that the cells grow upward. And we replace the cell layers with the same types of cells that were there before. The tissue is regenerated. It looks the same, it functions the same as it was before. All right, questions on that. The epidermal growth factor, is that stimulated by the endocrine system? Is that like the... No, great question. No, this is stimulated by the tissue itself. This, the integument produces this in response to stress. So like we said, injury, shaving, chemical abrasion, mechanical abrasion, when we irritate the skin, when we stress the skin, it is the skin, the epidermis that actually produces the epidermal growth factor. Does this process make sense? It is really important that this process makes sense because guess what? This process is going to be used for the healing of both types of wounds. Because if you think about it, if you have a superficial wound or a deep wound, don't both of those involve the epidermis? Yeah. Yeah, so this is how the epidermis always repairs. So if you have this as an essay question on the exam, where you have to describe how a superficial wound of the skin would repair, this would be the process that you talk about. However, if you also have the essay question, how would a deep wound of the skin be repaired? You're still going to describe this process for the epidermis. Because how the epidermis heals is the same in both ways. What is different with a deep wound is how the dermis repairs. So notice here, we have a deep wound. This epidermis is still gonna use regeneration as its way of healing, but now we have this injury to the dermis and dermis heals via fibrosis. So notice with a deep wound, we are using both regeneration and fibrosis. Regeneration for the epidermis, which we described, so I'm not gonna bother going through it again. So what we're gonna focus on instead is how the dermis heals. Aren't scars all the way through the top though? I'm sorry? When, when you got a scar, it's like visible on the top, isn't it? It is, and we will see why that is indeed the case. We will see that, absolutely. Right, again, short version. If I get a tattoo, is the tattoo on the surface of my skin? No. no, it's deep, but we can see it through the skin. Well, guess what? The scar is pretty much deep to the epidermis, but we can see it through the epidermis. Yeah. Excellent, all right, so. Fibrosis, which is what we're gonna focus on now, occurs with a deep wound. 
Now, one of the big differences with this deep wound is that it involves the dermis and the dermis is vascular. So that means there is blood with this injury. And the damaged tissues release chemicals. Uh, and as we talked about, what is the primary chemical that is released, well, way too small, uh, that is gonna be released in response to this injury or one of the main chemicals? Histamine. Yeah. Histamine, remember, is in the mast cells inside of the areolar connective tissue. And remember, it's in those dendritic cells in the epidermis. So we're gonna release histamine. Histamine is gonna dilate the blood vessels, swell the area, bring more blood, bring more heat, bring more oxygen to the area. And that is what we call inflammation, our inflammatory phase. Histamine is released by the damaged tissue, blood vessels dilate, white blood cells become active to destroy any harmful pathogens that might be there. And that blood br brings the platelets brings those fibers, the fibronectin we talked about to form that clot and to start that healing process. So the first thing that happens with this deep wound is we get this inflammation. All right, questions on that. All right, now, once a clot forms in this area, those fibers tighten and those fibers dehydrate. And when they do that, they form a structure that we call a scab. So that blood clot becomes a scab. And that scab is basically a temporary protection or provides temporary protection for the injury while it heals. So it stays on top while the tissue underneath is healing. Now, again, I told you I wouldn't emphasize it too much, but I do want to point it out. Notice our basal cells are migrating along the surface of the wound, starting that regeneration process. But like I also said, we want to focus on what's going on inside of the dermis. And as you see inside of the dermis here, there is primarily two types of cells that are very active in this area. These two types of cells are first fibroblasts. And of course, what do fibroblasts do? Create fibrous connections. Yeah. And not just any fibers, they're making collagen fibers. Excellent. And the other types are our macrophages. Macrophages, remember, are our big eater cells. Yes, any harmful pathogen, any bacteria or viruses that are there, it can destroy. But in this case, what it's primarily doing is breaking down and removing the dead and damaged cells. So our macrophages are removing this dead and damaged cells and the fibroblasts are replacing those dead and damaged cells with collagen fibers. Now, right, this is in second grade, so I'm not going to accuse any of you guys of being a scab picker, but if you've ever accidentally had a scab get rubbed off, when you look at the tissue underneath that scab, does it look like normal skin? No. No, it's typically very pink and also very spongy, right? There's that kind of pink spongy tissue. That pink spongy tissue has a name. Basically, what we're getting the formation of down here is what is known as granulation tissue. So that pink spongy fibrous tissue that is forming, the network where the healing is going to get, take place is what we call granulation tissue. 
And all of this is occurring in what we call the organization phase. So again, new capillaries grow into the area, bringing oxygen, bringing nutrients, and bringing the fibroblasts and the macrophages that make that granulation tissue. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. And this process continues. Yeah, we already talked about the epithelial cells. This process continues. Notice our, again, don't wanna emphasize it too much, but we will point it out. Notice our epithelial cells have reached each other, made their contact inhibition and are now growing upwards. Our scab is being broken down. But now when we look down in the granulation tissue, we've reached what is known as the proliferative phase. As I mentioned, these fibroblasts are making fibers and they're making lots of fibers. And that's part of the problem. If we fill the space with these collagen fibers, is there gonna be room for large blood vessels to grow back into that area? Or no. nerves to grow into that area? Or hair to grow into those areas? No. No, so typically they are less or they lack entirely hairs and nerves and large blood vessels and all of those different types of things that were there before are not there. Notice this is gonna change the look, the feel and the function of the tissue. It is not gonna look the same way, right? Often scabs are much lighter in color. Why are they lighter in color? Because all those collagen fibers underneath, there's no room for the large blood vessels. So without the large blood vessels, you don't get the darker color from the hemoglobin. You don't get the blood in that area. And they differ in texture. Yeah, it can change the feel because now, whereas you had that dense irregular connective tissue before, now you have a massive number of collagen fibers all aligned around the side of the line of the injury. That changes the feel, it changes the look of it. Absolutely, so all of these things can happen because of this massive, massive growth that is taking place. So those fibroblasts are very active. So less blood vessels, less glands, less hairs, all of that stuff in the area. And again, this can change the look, the feel, and the function of the tissue. But the muscles underneath will fully repair? Well, again, in this case, this is still just an injury to the skin. We notice we didn't go all the way down into the muscle. We didn't even go all the way down into the adipose. Yes, obviously the deeper the wound, it will affect other organs, other tissues as well. So we're still just talking about a deep wound to the skin. So great, thank you for asking that because you're absolutely right. We're still just talking about a deep wound to the skin. So we're just focused on the skin. So this deep wound involves both the epidermis and the dermis, but we're not worrying about anything underneath that. Thank you for asking that. All right, any other questions? All right, perfect. So finally, we reach our fourth and final stage, which is the maturation stage. Notice at this stage, the healing is complete or mostly complete. Definitely the epithelial tissue is complete. And so the scab sloughs off as a result of that. Right. Our epidermis is completely intact and has completely regenerated. Oops. Has regenerated, but the dermis underneath hasn't. All of those collagen fibers will start to tighten and align even more. 
And as they contract and they tighten in a line anymore, you get that very dark, distinct line, not dark, but typically light, distinct line that is that scar that forms as a result of that. Now, there are a couple important implications. Notice with this particular injury, we had a big gaping wound that filled up with all that granulation the tissue, filled up with all those fibers and left a big scar. So when a doctor does a surgery on you, do they just leave that open, that big gaping wound so you get that big massive scar? No. What do they do? Staple it together. Staple or, or glue it so or suture it, it together. By bringing the wound together, you reduce the amount of space where that granulation tissue is gonna form and you reduce the size of the scar. Now, is it possible to make the scar go away entirely? Yeah, is it always gonna go away entirely? No, there might be a line, but it will definitely be less significant. There's one other implication I wanna talk about as well. Notice in this case, in most cases, when the healing occurs, it comes back to the normal level of the skin where it was before, or might be slightly indented. However, is there a condition where the healing process, the growth process can actually cause the skin to bulge outward, forming an extended scar tissue out of the surface of the skin? Yes. Yeah, what do they call that condition? Anyone know? There yes. we go. Keloid formation. These things are called keloids. Absolutely. Why they occur is not fully understood. Keloids are more common in people that have darker pigmented skin than lighter pigmented skin, although lighter pigmented skin can get keloids. For the most part, keloids are benign. Uh, typically, they're not painful. In rare conditions, they can be innervated in a way where they can be painful, but typically they're not. However, some people can be extremely sensitive to them. They get a bug bite and itch it, and a keloid could form as a, re uh, as a result of that, right? Which is bad if it's on its arm. It's even worse if it's on your cheek. And if it's on your cheek, can you go and just snip it off so that it get rid of that keloid? They're more sensitive after the surgery. After yeah. the surgery, but um, then they are not, they actually losing all, pretty much all sensitivity. Yeah, it, it, they can be, like I said, they can be sensitive. Those keloids can form. And again, they can be really sensitive. And if you try to remove them surgically, they just unfortunately can grow back. So some people can be highly sensitive to them. Usually they're not painful. Usually they're benign. But uh, again, it is a condition that can occur. And we don't fully understand why that doesn't respect the boundaries of the skin for those individuals. We just know that it's something that happens. All right, excellent. No, and, and on that keloid, uh, would you, you'd still have the uh, epidermis over the top, it just protrudes out higher. <laughs> I broke the teacher. Got to wait to start drinking until after 1230. Uh, apparently. Oh, sorry, I had some the coffee go on the wrong way. <clears throat> the cartilage didn't work properly. <laughs> Damn apoglottis. Yep. <clears throat> So yes, um, the epidermis will be intact over the top of the keloid when it forms. So you will have still protection from the skin to just get that bulging scar. Oh man, <clears throat> that was bad. <clears throat> I highly don't recommend breathing coffee. That is not fun. <clears throat> 
All right, and the best part, it's recorded, so we've saved that for posterity. Awesome. All right, excellent. <clears throat> with that, we are done with the physiological processes that we wanted to talk about for this class. However, when we have some time, and today we have a little bit of time, I do want to talk a little bit <clears throat> about some of the homeostatic imbalances of the skin. And one of the primary imbalances of the skin are burns. Now, when someone is rushed in <clears throat> to the emergency room and you want to quickly assess the severity of the injury, what are the two characteristics, the two factors that we care about with burns? Blisters or not? I'm sorry, say again? Blisters or not? Okay, so blisters are not kind of really involve the depth of the wound. Whether there's a blister or not is an indication of how deep the wound is. So definitely depth is one of the factors we have to worry about. And what's the other one? <clears throat> area of skin affected? Yeah, amount or area <clears throat> of the skin affected. So not surprisingly, when we assess burns, those are the two things we want to talk about. Now, when it comes to the depth, how do we indicate how deep the wound is? <clears throat> the layers of the skin that's reached. True, absolutely. It involves which layers or sublayers are involved. But what do we call that? When you go in, they don't say, you know, and they're wheeling in, here's Bob, he has wounds to the dermis and epidermis. What do they say? First degree. First degree. Degrees, exactly. <clears throat> so when we're assessing our wounds, we do it by degrees. This depth. So again, we're here assessing depth for severity. <clears throat> and when we talk about depth, we talk about degrees. A first degree burn typically only involves the epidermis and it is typically even though the, in, in, the illustration shows it otherwise, it is either a partial <clears throat> or complete injury to the epidermis and the epidermis only. With these, they is, and again, I know the term mild isn't what seems to come to mind when someone comes up and slaps you on your uh, first degree burn, your sudden burn but it isn't a common example. It's a moderate pain, mild pain. One of the keys as was mentioned is that there's no blisters associated with it. And as we also talked about, typically first degree burns are associated with a dark redness, that erythema. And what causes that erythema? Inflammation. And yeah, well, more specifically in this case, you're right. The inflammation causes congestion of the blood. A lot of blood congests in the dermis underneath it. So remember, as we talked about, you can push on it and the redness goes away. How do first degree burns typically repair themselves? Just cellular regeneration. Yeah, typically with regeneration. And how long does that take? A couple weeks. Yeah. Uh, maybe a week. <clears throat> about a week, three to six days. And during this time, the skin will have its normal function. You're definitely aware of it, so your nerves are definitely working. But your rectal pili muscles can work. You still have hairs. You still have glands that are going to be functioning. I mean, the skin works normally. What should you peel? I'm sorry? But you can peel the skin, the dead skin. The dead, uh... Yes, as it heals, definitely those dead epithelial cells will peel off, absolutely. Now, first degree then, as we go a little deeper, takes us to a second degree burn. <clears throat> a second degree burn, and again, we wanna be precise with our definitions, involves all of the epidermis <clears throat> and some of the dermis. All 
All right, that is how we define a second degree burn. Second degree burns are also sometimes referred to as what we call wet burns. Because with a second degree burn, you get blisters that form. <clears throat> so that blister formation is something that is distinct to a second degree burn. Again, this is a much more damaging, much more painful type of burn. But typically, the hair, the glands, <clears throat> the nerves are not damaged by this, or at least not destroyed. So it's still going to be painful, right? You can still sweat in those areas and things along those lines. The damage is more severe, so it typically takes longer to heal. And again, depending on the severity, it can regenerate, but also some scars can form. <clears throat> so it is possible to regenerate them, but it also is possible that you could have some scars that form as a result of them. Now notice, and again, this is why this is key to the definition, some of the dermis. First and second degree burns are what are known as partial thickness burns because they do not involve the entire skin. This is different from our third degree burns. Again, we wanna be precise in our definitions. Third degree burns involve all of the epidermis, all of the dermis, and some of the hypodermis. <clears throat> so in this one, the entire skin is destroyed. Typically, these are more dry wounds, charred wounds. And ironically, typically at the location of the injury, does it hurt more or less? Less. 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 Because here, we are destroying the skin. We lose the nerves. We lose the glands. We lose the hairs. So ironically, in an injury like this on the hand, the first and second degree burns that surround it hurt a heck of a lot more than the three, third degree burn at the center because we've destroyed the skin. And again, with the destruction of the skin, we talked about the two main uh, dangers is going to be infection because you've lost that uh, protection from pathogens and also dehydration because you've lost that uh, water protection. So as we said, people with severe third degree burns are typically kept in a moist and a sterile environment. Now, with the complete destruction of the skin, is this area going to regenerate? No. No, this is gonna heal via scar tissue. This is gonna heal via fibrosis. So if you don't want a big, huge, massive scar in that area, what's one of the things we can do? Skin grafts. Yeah, we can do skin grafts. If we want to try to maintain some of the function, maintain some of the, uh, <clears throat> we'll get to that in a second. Maintain some of the function, I uh, maintain some of the appearance of it, maintain that water loss, maintain that protection from infection, they will often do skin grafts in those areas to try to replace the skin that has been damaged. Your epithelial tissue will grow back in that section though, yeah? It depends on the severity of it. Again, if, if the tissue is dead and damaged and scarred and burned, then the, uh, the basal cells are not gonna necessarily be able to migrate over it the same way. <clears throat> That's why for larger ones, it is so much important to do those skin grafts because there's only so much. Now those small ones like that, my guess is that the epithelial tissue probably would be able to cover those. Uh, but even there at the center, there might still be some, you know, where that, that dead and scarred tissue is, 
I have mine not closed entirely. So that's why, you know, getting that scar tissue, that burnt tissue removed, uh, trying to either suture it together to help it to close or getting that skin graft in there is something that's going to be very important. All right. That's what you need to know for the exam. You need to know those three different types of burns. However, just for curiosity's sake, is there such a thing as a fourth degree burn? Yes. Yeah, in fact, there are up to six degrees of burns when it comes to depth. Third degree noticed is all of the epidermis, all of the dermis and some of the hypodermis. A fourth degree burn is all the epidermis, all the dermis, all the hyperdermis, and some of the muscle underneath. A fifth degree burn is all of the epidermis, all of the dermis, all of the hypodermis, and all of the muscle. So you're down to the bone. And a sixth degree burn is when you actually burn through the bone as well. Right. So again, that's through the uh, skin, epidermis, dermis, hypodermis, muscle, and damaging the bone as well. Right. So there you are fighting your arch nemesis. Find out he's your dad. He lops off your hand and technically gives you a fourth degree burn. That's probably a sixth degree burn. All right. Questions on that. I have a question. So is scar tissue like rougher than like your actual skin? Like if you were to cut yourself and then the scar tissue grows back, is it rougher or thicker than the skin around it? Or uh, So thicker is tricky. I think, <clears throat> yeah, I think it can definitely have the feel of that. It isn't so much that there's an increased depth. I think what it really comes down to more is that with all of those collagen fibers together, it becomes less pliant, less movable. So it becomes a firmer and feels firmer and thicker as a result of that. So I don't think it's necessarily that you get more depth, it just, it becomes less movable. It becomes more rigid as a response to all of that massive amount of collagen fibers that are put in there. Right? So when you put all those things together, it becomes very, very tough and pliable and uh, not pliable. All right. Excellent. Questions on that? Any other questions? All right. That is the material that I wanted to cover for today. And that is everything you need to know for this first exam. All right. We still have almost a full hour left. So here is what we will do. We'll take a quick five minute break. This will give anybody the opportunity who wants to, to run free, fleeing from the building without everybody having to look at them and see that they're fleeing from the building. But we'll come back in five minutes. And in five minutes, as I mentioned, we will do a question and answer review. Again, a review is not me standing here telling you what I think is important. That is what I do every day in class. A review is an opportunity for you to ask questions about things that are not clear to you. Processes or concepts that we talked about, maybe we didn't spend enough time with it, or maybe because it happened two weeks and what now, eight lectures ago, you just don't remember it very well. So if you have questions or concerns or uh, about the process of the exams or the concepts of the exams, this will be an opportunity to ask those questions to help you to be successful. You are not required to stay for this, but hearing other people answer questions, ask questions and hearing the answers to them, are those things that could help you on the exam? Absolutely. If someone asks a question, am I gonna say, I can't answer that because that's an answer, because that's a question on the exam? No, absolutely not. All right, so again, ask your questions. Let's come up with the answers. Let's make sure that everybody is prepared for Monday. So like I said, let's take a quick five minute break. It's 11.38, so we'll just come back at 11.43. And at 11.43, we will uh, start our review. All right. Some people might find it helpful. So. This is your opportunity now to ask questions, concepts,
procedures. What can I give you to help you to be successful on the exam? Remember, as I said, if you guys don't ask questions, then I assume you've mastered all the material and I make the test harder. I had a note somewhere um, about cellular respiration, but then I couldn't find anything in my lecture notes or oh. text. Is that something that we do need to? Uh, it is definitely something that is going to be important moving forward. I'm not sure 100% if there is a question for that on the exam, other than, of course, where it occurs. Cellular respiration occurs where? In the mitochondria? Yeah, in the mitochondria. So remember, in the mitochondria, their job is to make the energy, make ATP. And as we talked about, the way that occurs is our cells take sugar, although they can do it with fatty acids as well. And what they need is oxygen. When oxygen is present, they are able to break down the sugar and enter it into uh, the mitochondria. And there in the mitochondria, it is used to produce a massive amount of energy. And that energy is used to make ATP. Right. If you've taken a biology 300 or 400 course, you know, at the electro electron transport chain and all of that kind of stuff. And again, or even micro, you may have talked about it. So I'm not going to bother worrying about that process. Uh, but the byproduct of that, there are two, is carbon dioxide and water. So this is the chemical reaction that is taking place in the mitochondria to give us the energy to make ATP. And because it requires oxygen and it produces carbon dioxide as a byproduct, it's basically called cellular respiration. This process that occurs in the mitochondria is the whole reason we do this. <sighs> to get the oxygen into our blood, to get it to the cells, to make ATP, and to get rid of the CO2 that the cells produce as a waste product. And so, yeah, so that is the process of cellular respiration. I don't think you need to know that equation. We'll get to points where you do need to know it, uh, but I don't think necessarily you need to know that. We talked about it, but like I said, in micro, in you know, bio 400 or 300, you'll learn more about those processes. And so I'm not overly concerned about it, but it is always good to check. Excellent, what's next? I had one other thing, which was just about, so I know on the lab exam, like there was the question about the, the phospholipids where it showed kind of the structure of that macromolecule and asked which one it was. Um, and I was just flipping through and I know that there's obviously structures like that for like steroids, uh, unsaturated and saturated fats, but they're a little less obvious, but are those things that we should be able to well, recognize? So I, I think you absolutely have the right idea. Now, do you need to know that there is a double bond between the carbon and an oxygen or something like that in one location? No, but if you see some symbolic structure that has a base and coming off of that base are three long dangly structures, right, linear structures, then what is this likely here? Triglyceride. Triglyceride. Right. And notice also, as we talked about, you may see a bend in that fatty acid. And what, tells you, what does that tell you about the bent one versus the straight one? How would you identify this straight fatty acid? Saturated. Saturated. And how would you identify this one? Unsaturated. True. Although we could probably be a little more specific than that. Compare that one to say... This one, mono, mono unsaturated right. versus this one I just drew, which would be poly unsaturated, right? So again, that's the level of understanding that I want you to have, right? With these globular types of things. When we looked at the symbolic structure of a uh, transfer RNA, for instance, how it had the binding point at the part at the top and then it had some codon structure down here at the bottom. 
Although that was one that remember we also saw it has that very distinct secondary structure where it's got that kind of clover shape to it. So those are things that you should be able to recognize as transfer RNAs. Uh, we know our ribosome had that big subunit with the three binding sites in it and the small subunit. Uh, I'm trying to think of any of the other ones we talked about. You mentioned the phospholipid, the one head, and then the two fatty acids. Again, I, I, I'm not going to expect you to know the exact chemical composition of these things, but most of these important macromolecules that we talked about had some distinct characteristic about them, three tails, two tails, clover shape, something like that, that made them hopefully obvious enough that you should be able to recognize them. That's basically just what it is, just recognition of what it is and being able to tell you, hey, this is Right. And what that's exactly, is. and that was exactly the question that was on the practice exam, right? I showed you a phospholipid. You didn't necessarily have to recognize what the head looked like or know the composition of it. Oh, you mentioned cholesterol. Cholesterol is another decent one because remember uh, that cholesterol or this or the lipid hormones that are made from them, cholesterol's distinct characteristic is it's made up of those four carbon chains together. We need to know that it's like Six 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 five, or just no. Again, you don't even need to know what the names of the functional groups. If you just recognize that it is had that it has got those four carbon rings, that should tell you that it is a, a cholesterol or a cholesterol-based hormone. Like you know, depending on the question. The other example when we were talking about the nucleic acids, right? The nucleic acids have those nitrogen bases. Some of them are made up of a single nitrogen ring with functional groups and some were made of a double nitrogen ring. What do we call the class of bases that are made up of a single ring? I'm glad you asked this question because then I get to ask this one. What were pi, the- Pi, pi, oh shit. No, not oh shit. Well, if you know the other one, you can give me that one as well. One class of nitrogen bases had two nitrogen rings. One had one. Can anybody give I can me? I tell you what's in them. I can tell you which ones make them. <laughs> okay, let's let's start there. Which were the ones that are just made up of one ring? Uh, uracil. Thymine. Uracil. Thymine. Thymine Cytosine. and. Cytosine. Excellent. And which were the ones that were made of two rings? Adenine and guanine. Excellent. So what do we call the ones that are made up of one? What's the general name for the class of one ring and the general name of the class with two rings? Is it a pyrimidine? Pyrimidine for the single <laughs> ring. And the two rings, the big ones are? Purine, there we go. Purine. Excellent. Thank you, Devin. Perfect. So there you go. So again, Things that you should, those are obvious things that we should be able to recognize by their appearance. So again, I'm not, do, do you need to know the difference between the, comp, the chemical composition and the functional groups of an adenine versus a guanine? Absolutely not. But should you be able to tell the difference between a purine and a pyramidine? Yes, that's something you should be able to tell. Awesome, great question. Any others? Well, then, no, let me rephrase that. What's the next one? There's got to be more. Give me more. Could you go over, over uh, active transport, specifically the uh, sodium and potassium pumps? Sure, absolutely. Let's do both of those things. So, Again, because it's always important to be precise, what you are talking about is primary active transport. With primary active transport, this is where we have a protein that directly uses ATP and it directly uses ATP to move a substance. And typically, which direction are we moving the substance if we're using ATP? Against the, against the gradient. Excellent. Exactly. So if I have a cell, 
and this cell has a special protein on it. Oops, no, wanted a box. This can be directly using an ATP, and ATP will bind to it, and it could move an ion like calcium. And if it was gonna move an ion like calcium, would it be moving it into the cell or out of the cell? Out of the cell. Excellent. So it uses an ATP and with that ATP, it is able to move calcium out of the cell. Okay, hopefully straightforward and simple enough. That and their calcium pumps, their sodium pumps, their potassium pumps, they're all these different types of pumps. And these typically are called pumps or because they directly use ATP, they're sometimes referred to as ATP aces. Remember ACE is basically just an enzyme, a protein that breaks something down. In this case, it's breaking down ATP and breaking down that ATP to do work, okay? That is primary active transport. Now, the most common primary active transporter that is found inside of the cell happens to be a transporter that is called the sodium potassium pump or the sodium potassium ATPase. Unlike the calcium pump, which just moves one thing, this one, as the name indicates, moves two things. Now it is still a primary active transporter, so it still takes the energy from an ATP. We still need that ATP energy. But in this case, it's gonna be able to use the energy from the ATP. And let's cheat and put the ATP here in the middle so that it won't be in my way to do two things. It is gonna move both sodium and potassium. Now, which way does it move the sodium? Out. Against its concentration gradient, out. Which way does it move potassium? In. Against its Against concentration its gradient, gradient, in. And does it use one ATP to move just one sodium and one potassium? No. No, the energy from one ATP is enough to move how many sodium out? Three. Three. And how many potassium get brought in? Two. Two. There we go. This does two really important things. It's one of the reasons why it's the most common. And a cell, when it's at rest, about 25% of its energy, its ATP, is being used just on these pumps. Why? Well, remember, as we've already talked about with those secondary active transporters, sodium really wants into the cell. And we use that to do work. A lot of the important processes that cells use take advantage of the fact that sodium wants to come in. We let sodium come in and it does work for us. But the reason it really wants to do work is it has a large concentration gradient. And if we keep letting sodium in, will we be able to maintain that concentration gradient? No. No, so we have to make sure we kick that sodium out. And notice it's more important to kick sodium out than it is to bring potassium back in because three sodium get kicked out, but only two potassium get brought back in. And that's the other important thing. Every time this uh, pump gets used, three positive things leave the cell, but only two positive things enter. This makes the cell more, uh, more negative. 
which you know is important because as we talked about, what is the resting membrane potential? Negative 70. Negative 70 millivolts, exactly. They have actually done studies where they've been able to use a chemical to block the sodium potassium pumps in a resting cell. And when they do that, the membrane potential of the cell rises to about nine, negative 55 millivolts. Almost 15 millivolts of that negativity of that negative resting membrane potential is caused just by these pumps. So this pump is huge because it allows us to use sodium to do work and it helps to keep the cell at its resting membrane potential. But it's still a pump. It directly uses its primary active transporter, a protein that directly uses ATP to move something where it doesn't want to go. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Anything else on this? Primary active transporters or these pumps? Uh, when it comes to the secondary yeah. um, active transport and the symporter and antiporter, like do we need, should we just be able to recognize that or explain that and how that is an active by the need of the ATP for the pumps? So I, I, I don't think you have to worry about recognizing them per se, but you definitely need to know their function. So they're, so great, let's do this again. We just did it with primary, let's do this with secondary. Active transporters. Again, we want our general definition. These are proteins. Uh, however, these proteins indirectly, well, let's do it this way. Do not directly use ATP to move molecules across the plasma membrane. Instead, they use the driving force of a, a molecule of a substance, let's say substance, and that substance is usually sodium, because as we said, sodium really, really, really wants to come in, but there are other uh, uh, secondary active transporters. So uses the driving force of one substance to move a second. Because of this, these secondary active transporters are called co-transporters. Now, you are right, there are two types of co-transporters. The first is a symporter where both substances move in the same direction and antiporters where oops both substances move in opposite directions so let's see two examples Now, as we said, most commonly, these co-transporters are gonna take advantage of sodium because sodium really, really, really wants to come into the cell. So what we do is say, okay, sodium, you really, really, really want to come into the cell, come onto the cell, we will let you in. However, you coming in, you gotta do some work for us. So when you come in, you need to either bring something else in with you. And that something else is typically something we want in the cell, like an amino acid or like a glucose or something along those lines. Or 
you, when you come in, you need to kick something out for us. Something we don't want in the cell. Like for instance, a hydrogen ion, or like we said, calcium makes cells do wonky things. So we might wanna kick it out that way. Both moving in the same direction. This one again is our symporter. This one's moving in opposite directions. So this is our antiporter. But remember, as we know, this is active transport. It has to use ATP. And notice neither of these molecules are using ATP. Instead, they're using the energy of sodium. Sodium wants to come in, so it does work for us. The problem is if sodium stops wanting to come in, it won't do work for us anymore. So as soon as that sodium comes in, what we need to do is kick that sodium out. All right, sodium, you've made it into the cell. You were happy for a minute, but now I'm gonna kick you back out so you still wanna keep coming in. And if I'm gonna kick sodium out of the cell, if I'm gonna get the sodium to move someplace it doesn't wanna move, what do I need to do to get that to occur? ATP use ATP. So I'm going to need to use ATP to get this sodium to go where it want it to go. So notice my secondary active transporters don't bind the sodium direct, I mean, don't bind the ATP directly. But if we don't use ATP to kick these out, then they won't keep working. So that's why we say it indirectly or does not directly use ATP. It relies on ATP to continue to do its work. But ATP doesn't change the shape of the molecule the same way that it did with the primary active transporters. And is sodium always going to be kicked out in like a sodium potassium pump or can it be just kicked out on its own? No. So like this, there can just be sodium pumps. Okay. So yes, again, the most common sodium pump is the sodium potassium ATPase but it's not the only one. There are plenty of other ones as well. So yes, yeah, so that's why I purposely didn't make this one the sodium potassium ATPase because I wanted to emphasize that all we care about is getting sodium out and we don't care how we do it. We have to use some type of primary active transporter, but it doesn't have to be the sodium potassium ATPase. There's plenty of other sodium pumps. Excellent, perfect. Now we did primary and secondary active transports. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Perfect. All right, any more questions? Um, when it comes to protein synthesis, mm -hmm. uh, the process of protein synthesis, do we need to know from start to finish, from so, inside okay. nucleus all the way out? Great question. So let's start easy. As we talked about, protein synthesis involves two very closely related processes. So how many possible essay questions does that uh, lend itself to? At least Three. two. Three. Describe the first process. What's the first process called? Transcription. Transcription. Describe the second process. What was that called? Translation. Translation and compare transcription and translation. So those are definitely three possible essay questions that I guarantee are in your test bank. However, remember, not only could you potentially have to just generically describe the process like that, but as I also mentioned, if I gave you a strand of DNA, could you give me not only the complementary strand of DNA, but if it was a template strand, could you give me the messenger RNA that would be formed by it? Could you give me the uh, transfer RNAs that would match up with the codons associated with it? And if I gave you a table, could you tell me what amino acids it would code for? Yeah, and could you do it in reverse as well? If I gave you a table and a, and a string of amino acids, 
Could you tell me the DNA that produced it? Yeah. So notice I, I, th that looks like five possible essay questions. And again, we spent pretty much a whole day talking about protein synthesis. So is there likely a test bank in your first exam that has those five questions and maybe one or two more related to it that you're definitely gonna get one of on this exam? I would be shocked if there wasn't. All right, so yeah. So I, I think for protein, now again, describe protein synthesis from beginning to end, no. Right, but those are, I think, and again, I haven't not finalized it, but my guess would be that those easily are the five easy essay questions that could be related to that topic that could easily be in a bank that you'll get one of the random ones up. And again, read the questions carefully. If it asks for transcription, don't give me translation. If it asks for transcription, give me transcription. If it asks you to compare transcription and translation, I don't want the entire description of transcription and the entire description of translation. I want comparisons. This does this, this does that, this does this, this does that, and so on and so forth. For that one, you don't have to describe the processes. Just tell me the parts of the process that are similar, the parts of the process are different, whatever the question asks for. All right, again, I love this class because it's hard. I can be straightforward. I have no problem telling you that there's a test bank with those five essay questions on it because I know you need to spend time learning and studying that. And that's what I love about this class. And because of that, there is nothing more frustrating for me than people giving away points. We talked about it on the lab exam. Don't answer the hard part of the question by saying this is the antecubital region and forgetting to say that it's the right. Because if you don't say right antecubital, you're not getting full credit. And when you give me the hard part by remembering that this is the antecubital region and you forgot to write right, I hate taking away half a point for that, but I'm going to do it. When you do an amazing job of describing the process of the ribosomes and the transfer RNA and the amino acids and the start codons and the stop codons, and the question was describe transcription, that makes me sad because you showed me major, major knowledge, but you described the wrong process. Again, I've said it so many times, I will continue to say it. People often lose points, not because they don't read the questions or they don't know the information, but because they don't read the questions carefully. Read the questions carefully so you can answer them correctly. Some questions may have three parts to them. Make sure you answer all three parts. Some questions may ask for four things. Make sure you give me four things. In the lab exam, if right and left matter, make sure you put right and left. Now, is there a right and left Golgi apparatus inside the cell? No. No, of course not. But is there a right and left acromial region of the body? Yes, yeah. absolutely. So again, don't answer the hard part of the questions and lose points for the easy parts. There should be plenty of time for you to complete these exams. Take your time, read the questions carefully, answer them correctly. All right, any other questions? Yeah, I had a question about the, the tests, the exams. Yeah. Are they all going, are the questions gonna be available to us one at a time or all at once? Uh, so just like the practice exam, all of the uh, all of the lab questions should present all at once. Uh, I think that's a better format uh, because uh, quite something that you see on question 17 uh, may make you second guess your answer on question two. Now, if I do it one at a time, it is possible to go back. Uh, but one of the things that um, that uh, Proctorio warns you about is as you if you bounce back and forth between the exam, there's some instability issue and you could get kicked out. It will let you get back in again, but when you get back in, you got to jump through all the hoops again. You got to scan your area, you got to show your ID, you have to do all that crap over again. And so it's a waste of time. So it's better if they I find it from a taking an exam standpoint, it makes more sense to have all the pictures there at once. 
However, as I've warned you, some people, especially, and again, a lot of it can also be your location. You can have very stable internet, very fast internet in your house, but if you're in the farthest corner away from it, some places have better internet you know, access than others. Make sure you're in a place where you have good, strong, reliable internet access so that these images can load, because sometimes there will be some delays in the loading of this and problems that can occur. So uh, while one at a time would help with loading speeds, I prefer not to do it that way. I think it's better from a test standpoint to have them all at once. And that is doubly true for the lecture exams. With the lecture exams, it's all text. So yes, you'll have all the questions, all the multiple choice, all the fill in the blank, all the essay questions, all at once, and you can do them in any order you want. All right. Can we just like really briefly talk about the like cellular level of different tissue types? So like for just as an example, like connective tissue proper, so like areolar or any kind of like dense or loose tissue, are those always fibrocytes and fibroblasts? Or like what's is there differentiation other than like if it's cartilage, which is chondrocytes? So you, great question. So you are right. Each connective tissue does have different combinations of the cells. Osteocytes are the only ones that are found in, and osteocytes and osteoblasts are the only ones found in bone. Chondrocytes and chondroblasts are the only ones that are found in cartilage. However, remember when we talked about especially a real art connective tissue, a real art connective tissue is one of those unique ones that has room for lots of cells. So in there, you find fibroblasts making fibers, but you also find some adipocytes, right? In fact, if it fills up with adipocytes, it suddenly becomes adipose tissue, right? And there'll be unique cells like the mast cell that you have to identify. But most tissues are typically comprised, uh, one, most connective tissues are typically uh, made up of one type of cell. Right, your fibrous connective tissues have the fibroblasts and fibrocytes. Right, blood has its formed elements. Um, um, the you know the the cartilages have the chondrocytes and all that. You're right. I think the loose tissues are the only ones that really there's a little more space in for more stuff. But even with the loose ones, as we talked about, the adipose tissue is almost entirely filled with adipocytes. So really, I guess it's reticular which has room for a lot of white blood cells inside of it. And then the areolar, which has a combo platter of cells in there. At most of the rest of the tissues, uh, connective tissues are comprised of really just primarily one type of cell. And then for epithelial tissue, I mean, we've talked a lot about like keratinocytes and melanocytes, but what about the non-keratinized? Well, so those are just the cells in skin. So those are specifically the cells in skin. For instance, in the ones in the mouth, uh, the ones in the lungs, those are not, uh, those are not um, keratinocytes, obviously. So really, those are just epithelial cells, okay. right? Epithelial cells are primarily named by their shape, right? So you have columnar and cuboidal and squamous cells. Yes, in certain tissues like the skin, they have a specific function and therefore have a specific name. But you know, just because a, column, a columnar shaped cell in the skin is a keratinocyte doesn't mean the ones in the stomach are keratinocytes, mm -hmm. right? Just like because the squamous ones on top are keratinocytes doesn't mean that the squamous ones in the lungs are. So I think with epithelial tissues, mostly we just identify the cells by their shape, squamous cell, cuboidal cell, columnar cells. Great question. That's an awesome one. I hadn't thought of it that way before. That's a fun way to think of it. I like that. Could you go over the mast cell for me one time? I think like I daydreamed or something while you were talking about it. I'm not 100% sure. So in the areolar connective tissue, there are lots of cells that we see. In fact, there are lots of cells we see in lots of tissues. But as we talked about, mostly when we see a cell, in a tissue, we're not really seeing the whole cell. Typically, we're just seeing the nucleus, right? The one exception to this that we found was here in our areolar connective tissue. In an areolar connective tissue, we saw a cell that had a nucleus, but we also saw its entire cytoplasm. And the reason we were able to see the entire cytoplasm 
is this cell was chock filled with a whole bunch of really, really dense granules. And these dense granules are that histamine. Those histamine granules are located, are located, that's not right. These histamine granules are dense structures found inside of the cell that are so dark and distinct that it allows us to see the entire cytoplasm. So it typically will, even though I've, I've drawn it as a cloud, typically it will have a very grainy appearance to it because of all the granules inside of it. And the fact that we don't just see the nucleus, but we see the entire cytoplasm because of these granules is a dead giveaway that we're looking at a mast cell. And as we just saw with our deep tissue wound, these mast cells are gonna release the histamine that are gonna start the inflammation and start that healing process. So it was the one cell in our areolar connective tissue that you had to be able to recognize. And it's because it is so obvious. So when you see the cobwebby, uh, when you see the cobwebby fibers and you see a cell that has a lot of granules in it, that's a dead giveaway you're looking at a mast cell. That is filled with histamine. Anything else? All right, well, I will remind you, I have office hours right after this. Uh, so I will still be doing my office hours even though I'm out of town because I know we have an exam on Monday. So if you have any questions, even if you wanna go grab a bite first and then come back, I will be there from 12.30 to 1.30 like normal. Uh, or you may send me emails. I will respond to emails all weekend long if you have any questions this way. I hope everything goes well. And if everything goes well, I will not see or hear from you again until Tuesday. However, as I mentioned, if you have problems on the exam, the very first thing you do is contact Pretorio's uh, tech support. Hopefully they'll be able to quickly uh, resolve that issue for you. They're very good at doing that. If you continue to have problems, then definitely by all means reach out to me. I will uh, not be in Zoom, but I will be at my computer uh, with the computer on with, the, uh, with, the, with my uh, um, uh, mailbox up so that I can quickly respond to anybody who has any issues. So if you have any issues, reach out. I will get back to you within a couple minutes and uh, hopefully we can get this resolved quickly so that you can complete the exam without any problems. Good luck, study hard this weekend, read the questions carefully so you can answer them correctly. Good luck, have fun, and I will see you Tuesday when we tackle the skeletal system. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Bye. Have a great day.